Once Upon a Date, Do Over Date Series, Book 6 By Susan Hatler Chapter 1 After building up the guts to submit my romance manuscript to my dream publisher, I just received a rejection email calling the book of my heart unrealistic, unimaginable, and unpublishable. Talk about brutal. You'd think I'd be at home right now banging my head against my laptop and screaming, I don't get why you hate my novel. Where did I go wrong, world? Where did I go wrong? But, no. After receiving the worst news of my life, my best friend thought it would cheer me up to accompany her to a masquerade ball at the Jeffreys Hotel in downtown Sacramento. Due to the aforementioned trauma, my bumble brain didn't have the forethought to decline the invitation. This was why I was currently climbing out of a taxi behind Krista and wishing I were at home in bed with my head under the pillow. Remind me again how being in a crowded ballroom while wearing a black silk dress with a rhinestone crisscross halter is supposed to be helpful when I'm feeling, and likely looking, my worst? I asked, shutting the cab door. You look fabulous, Michelle, she said, giving me a sympathetic look. And, for the umpteenth time, I'm not going to let you stay home and be miserable over this one rejection. Another publisher is going to love your book and buy it, the right publisher. I sighed. My unrealistic, unimaginable, and unpublishable book. She waved a hand dismissively. Just one annoying editor's worthless opinion. Prince and Company is well respected, I reminded her. We were striding down the sidewalk in our heels when all of the sudden a bug or something flew into my eye. Ouch! I blinked rapidly. Hadn't my day been traumatic enough? Apparently not. Sigh. Did I mention that Prince and Company was my number one choice for a romance publisher? I asked. A gazillion times, Krista said, dabbing gloss on her lips as she glanced at me briefly. Well, it bears repeating, I said, since she didn't seem to get what a huge blow this rejection was to my future career. Pain stabbed my cornea and I rubbed my eye trying to get the gnat out of my vision as the editor's words echoed through my brain again. Unrealistic, unimaginable, and unpublishable. That was his professional feedback on my novel. Well, that editor obviously has a miserable life and he wants everyone to be just as miserable, too. I mean, how hard is it to say no thanks or not a good fit for me? Not hard. Now, stop rubbing your eye or you'll look like a panda, Krista said, smoothing the front of her long red dress. We both need this night out and we're going to enjoy it. You'll see. I sighed, hoping she was right. I glanced her way through my blurred vision, knowing I needed to push the rejection out of my mind so I didn't ruin her night. You look like Julia Roberts in Pretty Woman, I said, admiring the red off the shoulder gown that clung to her every curve before falling to the sidewalk in a graceful fishtail. Then I blinked and nudged the corner of my eye with my knuckle. Fancy is a good look on you. I'm used to seeing you in athletic wear, especially those outfits from the new fashionably fit line. What can I say? I'm versatile. Seriously, though, stop rubbing your eye. I raised a shoulder. So what if I look like a panda? Pandas are cute, right? With their black and white fuzzy fur, looking all soft and cuddly while they eat bamboo shoots on top of a mountain. We're in Sacramento, not China, Krista pointed out. I really need to lay off the Disney nature movies, I said, shaking my head. You definitely needed to get out tonight. If only I could get this thing off my pupil, I said, widening my eyes and blinking fast, hoping to dislodge whatever bug had rudely invaded my vision. Krista stopped outside the hotel, giving me a concerned look. You look like you're chewing a hornet. Something is in my eye. I can feel it. She leaned close, staring into my eyes. I don't see anything. It feels like a gnat or something, I replied. Could it be a speck of dust on your contacts? 
It's possible, I took a deep breath and a brilliant idea hit me. Maybe I should run home and get my glasses and then… No way, not happening. I know you too well, my dear. Getting your glasses is just an excuse for you to go home and stay home. You're here to get your mind off your woes and have fun, remember? Vaguely, I said, figuring it was too late to fake a headache and bolt. I had no choice but to follow her through the gold double doors of the Jeffreys Hotel. Come on, Krista said, lacing her arm through mine as we entered the lobby. You'll perk up in no time. Trust me. Crossing my fingers you're right, I said. My black heels clicked across the marble floor of the lobby as we passed the check-in counter and then the concierge desk. We turned left toward the lounge and I glanced up at a gold-framed advertisement for the masquerade ball event of the season. Why hadn't I written my fairy tale romance about a masquerade ball? Perhaps the editor wouldn't have hated that idea. Or maybe he was just a miserable person like Krista said. I hoped she was right. Otherwise, I'd spent the last eight months perfecting a book that would never see the light of day. Whether it's dust or a gnat my contacts are now killing me, I said, rubbing both of my eyes. Oh, wait a minute. I think I put my glasses in my evening bag. I don't know why you're not wearing your glasses tonight. They suit you. Well, I thought it would be hard to wear a mask over them. But at this point I'm desperate. Look, there's the ladies' room. Go take your contacts out and put your glasses on, so everyone in the ballroom doesn't have to see your guppy face in action. Thanks. That makes me feel way less self-conscious, I said, rolling my eyes. Don't worry about my fish face, Krista. I'll find a dark corner and slip my contacts out. The truth was that I did want to find a dark corner, but not to take my contacts out. I'd snuck my laptop into my black tote. I know I needed to sit down and send out new query letters to a second list of publishers I had saved on my laptop. After this painful rejection, I might lose my nerve to try and get my book published if I didn't send out these new queries right away. As an aspiring author, I could only take so many knives thrown at my ego. I mean, it felt like the editor had ripped out my heart and then kicked it for good measure. Not fun, not fun at all. I stopped outside the ballroom and took a deep breath. You know what, Michelle? Krista grinned, running an appraising eye over my silky black dress. You're going to have a fabulous night and you'll be thanking me tomorrow. I mean, you look like Reese Witherspoon at the Golden Globes, only taller. Thanks, I think, I said, figuring Reese obviously hadn't let rejection get her down or she wouldn't be where she is today. I needed to suck it up and keep moving forward. So, I pulled out my elegant yet large gold mask with its elaborate rhinestones and feathers, slipped it over my itchy eyes, and then tied the black silk ribbons together behind my head. Krista slipped her red, feathered mask over her eyes and turned to me. How do I look? I gave her a second glance and shook my head. It's a good thing I wasn't meeting you here or I never would have recognized you. Same goes for you. Very elegant and mysterious, she said, giving my cheek an air kiss. Then we nodded at the tuxedoed man, who opened the ballroom door with a flourish. The music, which had sounded muted from outside the ballroom, washed over us as we walked inside. Krista clapped her hands together, her excitement making the corners of my mouth curve upward for the first time today. She didn't normally love the glamour and glitz, but this ball was a fundraiser for Founding Friendships, a homeless outreach organization where she volunteered. Krista had come pretty close to living on the streets as a kid. She told me stories about growing up in a trailer park in Eureka, California where her mom still lived today. I'd volunteered with her a few different times at Founding Friendships and it really did seem like a worthy organization. A woman waved to us from across the room and Krista turned to me. I think that's Jill Parnell, who runs Founding Friendships. 
I need to talk to her about a few things. Will you be okay on your own for a little while if I go say hi to her? Of course. Take your time. Dance a few times and please don't worry about me, I said, relieved to have some private time to hide in a dark corner with my laptop. You've done your duty. I'm out of the house. Now go have fun. Okay, sweetie. I'll catch up with you in a bit. Say hi to Jill for me, I said, nodding at her as she walked away. Another reason I wanted to find a chair was because my black stilettos were already pinching my feet. I scanned the room for somewhere to sit and spotted a cocktail table with chairs against the far wall, which looked vacant apart from a deserted champagne flute. Jackpot. That table was so mine. I hurried around the edge of the dance floor, wincing in pain with each step. It had been a mistake to wear brand new heels, but Krista had taken me shopping at Shapely Shoes earlier, also to cheer me up, and insisted on buying them for me as a thank you for agreeing to be her plus one tonight after her latest relationship ended abruptly via text messaging. I hadn't seen them working out anyway, but who was I to judge? I hadn't had a decent date in over a year. Once I reached the table, I set my bag down and looked around the opulent ballroom, taking everything in. The decor was impressive. Round tables circled the dance floor, each one covered in a gold damask tablecloth and set with chairs, their high backs intricately carved. Marble floors stretched across the ballroom from wall to wall and the edge of the wooden dance floor had a beautiful gold fleur-de-lis pattern. The dance floor was filled with masked guests letting loose and shaking their hips. I spotted Krista with Jill getting down to the music with a group of masked ladies on the far side of the floor. She caught my eye and I waved to her, gesturing to the table. She nodded and blew me a kiss. I sat down gratefully and pulled out my laptop, moving the half-empty, or half-full, I supposed, if one hadn't had the day I had a vacated champagne flute to the other side of the table. Kicking my heels off under the chair, I sighed with relief and opened my computer. It wasn't that I didn't like wearing high heels. In fact, the pair Krista had bought me were gorgeous. My feet just weren't used to wearing them since I didn't have the money to buy elegant heels like this. I spent most of my time in yoga pants, oversized sweaters, and fluffy socks. They hadn't dubbed people like me starving artists for nothing. I typed in my password and as I waited for my emails to load, I looked around me. The mood was upbeat. If I wasn't so stressed about rebounding from my manuscript rejection, I would likely have been enjoying time on the dance floor with Krista. Long, slender icicle-type decorations hung from the ceiling, and I smiled to myself since they reminded me of my favorite childhood book, The Snow Queen. It was also incredible seeing all the beautiful masks, which made these elegant guests unrecognizable. Anonymity was fine by me right now, because it meant I could send out my manuscript in peace. After about ten minutes, I'd already sent out five queries. Yay, me! Take that prince and company. Excuse me, a husky male voice said, interrupting my thoughts and pulling me out of my entranced work haze. My eyes locked onto a black tuxedoed arm that reached across the table and retrieved the champagne flute I'd moved. Oh, sorry, my gaze followed the crisp white cuff peeping out below the black sleeve and the smell of designer cologne reached my nose and I breathed in the heady scent. Yum. I lifted my eyelashes and my breath caught in my throat as I gazed into the bluest eyes I'd ever seen, which were twinkling behind a black satin mask. The mystery man's lips were full and the thought of kissing him sprang unwittingly into my mind. My cheeks heated. Get a grip, Michelle. In a slow and deliberate move, he held out a hand. Would you care to dance, Cinderella? Me? Dance? Oh, yes. No, wait. I bit my bottom lip. I didn't want to dance at all. I had a plan, a plan to send my manuscript to every last publisher on my list to shed some light on this dark day of rejection. I waited for the words to come from my mouth, politely declining the man's sweet offer. 
But as I stared into those mesmerizing blue eyes, I found myself smiling for the first time today and saying, why, yes, Prince Charming. I'd love to dance. Chapter 2 The mystery man took my hand and the feel of his skin against mine sent tiny tingles skittering up my arm. Whoa. I'd never had that reaction to a man's touch before. Well, not unless you counted my high school boyfriend who had smashed my heart and dumped me right before graduation, not a pleasant memory. I slipped my feet into my heels, which pinched my toes immediately, as if the designer shoes were made of glass just like the real Cinderella's slippers. Ouch. How had she managed to wear those things all night? Oh, right. She was animated. As a non-animated human, I willed my feet to make it through at least one song with this mystery man. He led me past elegantly dressed guests on the dance floor until we found a space of our own. As he turned to face me, the throbbing beat from the DJ's fast song faded out and the notes of Beauty and the Beast started up. Celine Dion started singing the first words and soon Peebo Bryson's amazing voice belted out, sending chills up my arms. Or maybe the chills were due to this handsome stranger staring down at me with those gorgeous blue eyes behind his black mask. The corner of his mouth lifted. If only you were wearing a yellow ball gown. You know this song? I asked, raising my eyebrows and looking at him quizzically. Air, well, as quizzically as was possible with a mask covering half my face. How are you familiar with Disney's Bell? I asked. My niece is enthralled by the Disney princesses, he said, gently pulling me into his arms and then swaying to the music in a way that made my legs turn gooey. I've bought a gown or two at birthday time over the years. Really? I asked, recalling that the last guy I dated hadn't even remembered my birthday. Not that this was a date. Just a dance. But, still, my heart was pounding and it felt a little hard to breathe with him this close to me. That's so sweet that you know what she likes. I have my moments, he joked. Well, I can't claim to be channeling Belle tonight anyway, I gestured to my banana blonde strands that hung past my shoulders. Wrong hair color. He captured a few wisps between his fingers, leaning forward to study them before letting the strands fall again. Like spun gold. Spun gold, huh? I asked, trying not to let it show that my heart rate had kicked into high gear. Sticking with the fairy tale theme, I said, would that make you? Rumple stilt skin? The corner of his mouth hitched up and he touched my hair again, lifting a lock in his hand. All this must be spun tonight, and if it is, you shall be my queen, he said, quoting the book. Impressive, I said, a delicious shiver running up my spine at his reciting the king from the story. The thought of being this masked stranger's queen made me a little too giddy. But, I mean, this man knew his books and that was the sexiest thing of all. He moved a little closer as we danced to the romantic melody. I fell silent. The talk of fairy tales reminded me, once again, that my book had been rejected by the one publisher I had set my heart on. I fought to push that depressing thought out of my mind, but I wasn't having much luck. Turns out crushed dreams don't just go away during a romantic fairy tale dance. The music changed to a song I didn't recognize, but this mystery man made no move to let go of my hand. Instead, he took a step back and studied me as I looked up at him. Why the sad face, he asked. Am I that obvious? I asked, wondering how he could read me so well with half my face covered. Not wanting to spoil the mood, I shrugged. Just one of those days, you know? Disappointment at work, that's all. How so? I sucked in a breath. A project I turned in wasn't good enough, apparently, so it's back to the drawing board for me. His forehead crinkled. I can't believe anybody would reject you. Your boss must be an idiot. I was about to tell him it wasn't my boss, but then thought better of it, deciding instead to keep things upbeat. 
So, tell me, Rumpel, are you a supporter of the Founding Friendships Organization? Or, are you just here for the free champagne? Speaking of which, he nodded toward a passing server, slipped his hand around mine, and led me toward the little round table where he'd first found me. He lifted two champagne flutes from the server's tray and set the glasses on the table. Then he pulled a chair out for me. Thank you, I said, slipping into the seat and kicking off my heels. In answer to your question, he slipped into the seat next to me and took a sip of champagne before setting the glass down again. If you'd asked me half an hour ago, I would have said I support the foundation but am also here for the champagne and canapes. I tilted my head. And what would your answer be now? That I'd forgotten about the champagne until you mentioned it. A small smile formed on my lips. And the canapes? He shook his head. Someone has me too distracted to think about canapes. I'll take that as a compliment. I smiled and then took a sip of champagne. This guy was way too enticing. So unusual that a man could capture my interest like this. Nice laptop, he said, nodding at my bag. Oh, um, I cringed. Suddenly, bringing my I'd rather be reading tote bag tonight didn't seem like such a good idea. I thought of my sophisticated black satin purse discarded on my bed at the last minute as I was leaving the room. Turn pages, not heads. He examined the stickers on the top with interest. Read between the lines. To read or not to read, is that even a question? Am I sensing a pattern here, Belle? I smiled, liking the nickname. I raised a bare shoulder. What can I say? I like books. His eyes flicked to mine for a long moment before he turned his attention back to my laptop. And this one? I watched him tap his index finger against the biggest sticker on my laptop, which was a photograph of the most beautiful heels of all. Silver, sparkly, and way beyond my budget. But I kept them there for inspiration. Someday my shoes would come and hopefully be more comfortable than the pair on my feet. Ah, those heels. I bit my bottom lip and then smiled. Some people dream of buying a house, or a fancy car, or a boat in St. Tropez. Me? I dream of owning a closet full of beautiful shoes, and I will, one day. I didn't add that if my manuscript hadn't been rejected, part of my advance would have been spent on those gorgeous heels. He chuckled. Reading and shoes. You certainly have interesting priorities. I raised an eyebrow, immediately regretting it as my contact lens stung my eye again. Guess there's a lot to learn about me. He lifted a few strands of my hair again. Fortunately, I'm a good student. My heart flipped. How could this man, this complete stranger, make it so challenging for me to breathe properly? In the space of an hour I had gone from no interest in dating to not wanting this date, although it wasn't a date, really, to end. An elderly lady sat down at the table and then looked up at us in surprise and confusion. Oh, I'm sorry, dears. I thought this was my table. I must have gotten confused. Without missing a beat, Rumpel stood and held out his hand to me as I slipped my feet back into my heels. No, this table is yours. We must have been confused and sat at the wrong table. He winked at the old lady, who looked relieved. It must be the champagne. As we walked away, I glanced over at him. You know that was our table, right? He leaned close to my ear. I didn't have the heart to tell her she'd gotten it wrong. It seemed kinder to give up the table. I hope you don't mind. He'd been acting for her benefit? So sweet! Do I mind that you're an incredibly thoughtful gentleman? I'm going to go with no. I said, amazed at this masked man walking beside me. 
Just before we reached the dance floor, I suddenly stopped, our joined hands causing our arms to stretch between us. He turned to me with raised eyebrows. I stepped forward, closing the distance between us, with my gaze on those blue eyes behind the mask. Adoring uncle? Knows his books? Gives up tables for the elderly? He was like a hero out of a modern-day fairy tale. Maybe it was the day I'd been having and how this man had suddenly turned it around, or maybe it was the way my skin felt against his, but whatever the reason I suddenly went up on my tippy toes, closed my eyes and pressed my mouth to his. He stilled for a moment as if he were surprised by my actions. Truth be told, I was a little surprised myself. But a few seconds later, his hand brushed against my cheek and his mouth captured mine. My head swirled at his sweet, lingering kiss and I melted against him. Okay, we'd only known each other a brief amount of time, but I knew enough to realize that a man like him didn't come around every day. As his lips brushed against mine, shivers skittered up my spine, and it felt like we were at a real-life fairy tale ball. This felt like a romantic scene from my book and I felt completely lost in the moment. There you are, Michelle. Krista shouted, causing me to jump back with my heart hammering for a whole new reason. She held her cell phone out to me. Sorry, but it's an emergency. Your stepbrother is in a real predicament, if you know what I mean. What? I asked, coming out of my dreamy haze. He's on the phone. You'd better talk to him, like now. I glanced up at Rumpel, who graciously stepped back. I'll give you some privacy, he said. I nodded, taking a deep breath as I put Krista's phone to my ear. What trouble had Philip gotten into now? Hello? I said. Michelle? Is that you? Philip asked. There was someone yelling in the background on the other end of the line, I plugged my other ear and moved away from the dance floor in order to hear better above the music. I frowned. Philip, what is going on? Please come and help me. My landlord is kicking me out. He says I forgot to pay my rent this month. Did you? I asked. Well, yes, he admitted. In the background, I could hear the foul-mouthed landlord shouting that he'd forgotten last month and the month before and that he was done being a nice guy. But it's not my fault I got laid off from work. He's going to kick me out if I don't come up with the cash right now. Are you kidding me? I asked, sucking in a sharp breath. The panic in his voice clearly told me this was no joke. I heard the landlord yell that he'd called the police. He says the cops are on their way. Please, sis. I need you. My heart tugged as I made the decision. Okay, Philip. Tell your landlord to hang on and that I'm coming now. Just try not to make the situation worse. Apologize until I arrive. I handed the phone back to Krista and turned to say goodbye to Rumpel, but he was nowhere in sight. I looked around the entire room, wanting to thank him for the dance. I couldn't leave without saying goodbye. But then the image of Philip being thrown in jail crossed my mind. There wasn't time to search for the man who had turned my day around. Because my irresponsible stepbrother had gotten into serious trouble and I needed to bail him out, literally, if I didn't arrive soon. With a heavy heart, I quickly relayed to Crystal what happened and apologized for having to leave. Then I fled the ballroom, hailed a cab outside the hotel, and hopped in. I didn't know how to get a message to Rumpel since I didn't know his phone number or even his name. Disappointment flooded through me as I realized I was unlikely to ever see him again thanks to my wicked stepbrother. Only after I was halfway to Philip's apartment did I realize I'd left my laptop behind. Chapter 3 The cab pulled to a stop alongside the curb outside of Philip's apartment complex and I hurried up the walkway, feeling a pang of sympathy for my stepbrother. He also seemed to be messing up and I know that had hurt his self-esteem. 
I put my finger out to ring his doorbell when the front door opened and a couple of men walked, or rather stumbled, out. They looked me up and down, and it dawned on me that I was still wearing my black silk dress. Overdressed for a Thursday night? Me? Maybe a little. As the two guys turned down the sidewalk, I glanced around and there were no police cars in sight. Also, music was coming from Philip's apartment. Very weird for someone about to be arrested and kicked out of his rental unit. Since the door was still open from the two guys who had left, I went in and found my stepbrother in the kitchen. Sis! Want a drink? I'm celebrating. I came as quickly as I could, Philip, I said, glancing around the kitchen but nobody else was in there. Where is your landlord? Hugo left when he heard you were coming over to help me out again, he said, taking a swig from his bottle of beer. You're supposed to go to his unit to work out the details. Is that so? I asked, shaking my head. He would be drinking with friends, while I solved his financial problems, even though I had been yanked from my evening with the most interesting man I'd ever met. What was wrong with this picture? I blew out a breath, crossed to the living room and turned the music off. You said that the police were coming, Philip. That's what Hugo told me. Guess he was bluffing, he said, looking me up and down. What on earth are you wearing? You look like you've been going through mom's closet. I was attending a fundraiser event at the Jeffreys Hotel until you called me away. Oh. You sound upset, he said, grimacing. No, I'm furious. I put my hands on my hips and tried to keep calm by counting to ten, no twenty. No wonder mom had cut him off after his dad, my stepfather, had moved away. Philip had been down in the dumps since the divorce when his dad left two years ago. In all honesty, I felt sorry for him. I remembered how I felt when my parents divorced and it wasn't fun. Although Philip was only three years younger than me, at 25 he still hadn't gotten his act together financially. It was one of the things my mom and stepdad had argued over. When Philip found this apartment six months ago, I had co-signed on the lease so he could get back on his feet again. This was something I'd regretted many times since. As I walked back toward the kitchen, I noticed a pile of shopping bags stacked on an accent chair, bearing names from some of the most exclusive stores in Sacramento. Was this where Philip's rent money had gone? A designer shopping spree? Um, not to rush you but you might want to go to Hugo's sooner rather than later. He was pretty heated earlier. Yes, I remember the shouting, I said, shaking my head. The party is over tonight, Philip. I'm serious. With a sigh, I went upstairs to the landlord's unit and learned that Philip owed him $9,800 in back rent. I managed to smooth things over by offering him $1,000 up front, which was the entire sum of my savings account. Then I negotiated a deal with him to pay the balance by the end of the month. Philip, or rather I, had just over two and a half weeks to come up with the rest of the money. When I returned to Philip's apartment it was empty except for him, sitting alone at the kitchen table. He looked up expectantly. All sorted out? I nodded, feeling exhausted. You have until the end of the month to pay him $8,800, or you really will be evicted. I just paid him a grand to buy you some time. He pulled on the label of his beer bottle. I'll pay you back this time. I swear. That would be nice since that was all my savings. If you can't come up with the rest of the money you're out on the streets because I have no money left to give you. It's time you grew up, Philip. Yes, your dad left. Yes, he dropped all of us. But at some point you need to stand on your own two feet. You don't want to go through your life like this, do you? You've always been the good kid in the family. I don't know how you do it, he said, tears filling his gray-blue eyes that were just like mine. 
You always seem to land on your feet. Nice apartment, money to spend, fancy parties to go to apparently. For your information, I was at a charity fundraiser for the homeless, which is how you're going to end up if you don't pull yourself together. He rolled his eyes. You sound just like your mom. I walked to the door, turning before I opened it. Yeah. Well you know what, Philip? She has a roof over her head and savings in the bank. You should follow her good example instead of criticizing her. He remained silent, but the muscle throbbing on his temple told me he'd heard me. Good night, Philip. He nodded. Good night, sis. I went outside and started to call a cab. Then I thought better of it and started walking in my pinching heels since I didn't have enough money left on me to pay for my cab ride home. After a morning run with my roommate, Missy Peters, I dropped her at her boutique clothing store, fashionably late, and went for coffee at Courtney Carmichael's coffee cart. Usually Missy would have joined me, but she was running late for a morning meeting. Good morning, Michelle. Courtney Carmichael's face lit up when she saw me. Courtney was an ex-attorney and had been highly successful in her career, but she'd been a workaholic. Eventually her husband left her due to neglect, or, so that was the reason he gave her. Realizing she'd been missing life while fighting battles in the courtroom, she decided to give up that fast-paced world and start over again with her coffee cart. Her coffee was delicious and she was practically a Sacramento icon. Everyone I knew came here. She seemed to have an ever-expanding collection of bright, flamboyant shirts, which she said she wore to remind herself that life is fun but fleeting. Today's tea said smile while you still have teeth and featured a sequined pair of red lips with teeth made up of tiny seed pearls. It almost made me smile. Almost. Is it a good morning, Courtney? I asked. I had woken up this morning in a mixed mood after last night. On the one hand, I was still annoyed with Philip's irresponsible behavior, but on the other hand, I couldn't stop thinking about my accidental date with Prince Charming, aka Rumple. On the other other hand, I needed to borrow an other after the chaos I'd been through, I felt worried sick about finding the money to pay for Philip's rent catch-up. Although I had told my stepbrother it was his responsibility, he knew as well as I did that as a co-signer, it was legally my responsibility to pay that rent. The advance on my book would have covered his debt, but now that Prince and Company had rejected my manuscript I was back to square one and in desperate need of another publisher. And coffee. I was in desperate need of coffee. Oh, dear, bad night? Courtney asked. You could say I had a bad night but you'd have to multiply that by ten, thanks to my stepbrother. I accepted my cup of coffee and leaned against Courtney's cart. Philip? What's he done now? Oh, you know, money and stuff. Actually, I'm more concerned about my laptop. I went to a charity ball at the Jeffreys Hotel last night. Fancy. Courtney nodded in approval. Definitely. But I left my laptop there. I called the concierge, but nobody had handed it in, so now I have no way of finding it. Courtney frowned. I know how much your laptop means to you, but I won't even ask why you had your laptop at a charity ball. I take it you didn't install the tracker we talked about after your mom gave you the laptop for Christmas? My mouth dropped open. Now I remembered. I'd installed the software right away, but I'd forgotten all about it. I took out my phone and searched through my apps to find it. Courtney peered over my shoulder as we waited for the map to spring into life. Sure enough, there was a little red dot, blinking as it made its way slowly along a downtown street. Your laptop is moving, she said, looking up at me. Hey, that address is only a few blocks from here. You're a genius. I grabbed a lid for my coffee and kissed Courtney on the cheek. Thank you. I'll let you know what happens. Good luck, she called out, 
before helping the next customer in line. I watched the dot moving as I followed the map, keeping one eye out for lampposts as I walked, head down. Hope filled my heart, not only at the thought of getting my laptop back, but also it dawned on me that perhaps my mystery man from last night had found it and was trying to contact me. I smiled. I was like a modern-day Cinderella, running out of the ball at midnight, although it had been closer to eleven, and leaving my glass slipper behind. Well, it had a sticker of my coveted glittery shoes on the laptop's lid, anyway. I checked my phone again. The red dot had stopped, its location just around the next corner. I groaned as I realized the offices of Prince and Company, my former dream publisher, current publishing nemesis, were on the same street. In fact, it appeared that my laptop had stopped right outside their door. I rounded the corner, becoming aware that I was wearing my normal novel writer's working uniform, yoga pants and an oversized sweatshirt. I'd left in such a panic this morning that I hadn't even thought about who I might run into. If it was Prince Charming, aka Rumple, holding my laptop, I hoped he liked the casual look as well as the elegant look. It was because I was deep in thought that I collided with the man, who was standing outside Prince and Company. Oof! I exclaimed, taking a step back and rubbing my forehead. I'm so sorry, I wasn't looking where I was going. I'm just glad I didn't spill my coffee all over. The man turned around, mesmerizing blue eyes meeting my gaze. It's you, my heart skipped a beat as I took in the rest of the man's appearance now that he wasn't wearing a mask. Dark hair. Glasses. Tiny scar above his eyebrow where he'd fallen off his bicycle as a child. Oh, no. Brooks Keller, I said. The man I had bumped into was not only the fairy tale hero from last night, but he was also Brooks Keller, my ex-boyfriend and all-round heartbreaker who had left me devastated when he broke up with me right before graduation. It was then that I noticed my laptop in his arms, which was ironic since that's where I'd spent a large part of my senior year at Blue Moon Bay High School. He looked a bit taller than I remembered, his physique more muscular, had he started working out, but his untamable dark hair seemed to be even wilder now. Michelle Moss, Brooks said, his voice sounding a little deeper but also so familiar that I couldn't believe I hadn't recognized it last night. I blamed the music. Thanks a lot, Celine Dion. It's been a long time. How are you? I'm fine, Brooks. I said, even though I wasn't fine now and I hadn't been fine back when he'd broken my heart. I narrowed my eyes at him. I'm actually thrilled to see my laptop, which you could have just turned into the Jeffreys Hotel. Your laptop? He looked from me to the laptop, and then back to me again. His eyes flicked to my hair, piled up on top of my head. Spun gold, he'd called it. No. I found it last night and am taking it into my office to see if I can figure out how to contact the owner since there is a lock and I don't know the password. Well, now you don't need to contact her, because I'm here. So, if you would just hand it over I'll let you be on your way, I said, annoyed to see him again, annoyed that he was Rumpel, and annoyed that he looked even more handsome than I remembered. Let's go inside and figure this out. He punched a number into the keypad and then stood back as if he were a gentleman and wanted to let me enter first. Would a gentleman have dumped his girlfriend before graduation with no explanation? I think not. You first, he said, since I hadn't moved. My gaze drifted to the embossed plaque beside the door and my mouth dropped open. Wait, you work here? I stared at the nameplate, which read Prince and Company Publishing. My head felt dizzy. Oh, this couldn't be happening. Yes, I do work for Prince and Company. In fact, I've just been promoted to editor. My ears started ringing and I couldn't believe what I'd just heard. I got out my phone and scrolled through my emails until I found the rejection email from Prince and Company. I scanned to the end of the letter, B. Keller, editor. No, way. I glared up at him. 
Not only had this man broken my heart in high school, but now he'd done it again almost ten years later by rejecting my manuscript. And he had picked up my laptop last night? My Prince Charming had turned into a toad, an editor toad, literally overnight. So not the way a fairy tale romance should go. Chapter 4 Taking a big long sip of coffee, I followed Brooks into the elevator and we rode in silence to the top floor to Prince and Company Publishing. I would have much preferred to walk as fast as I could in the opposite direction, but he had my laptop and wouldn't relinquish it until I proved my ownership. This was so typical of him, always practical and so. I wanted to say boring but I couldn't, because being with Brooks had been the most exciting time in my life. I studied him out of the corner of my eye, remembering last night. Rumpel had been charming, funny, romantic, and gentlemanly, whereas Brooks was rude and pig-headed. The only bright side was that the muscle on the side of his jaw seemed to be working overtime. Even with his cool demeanor, I could tell he was as uncomfortable as I was. Ha! Last night, his hair had been combed back neatly, whereas today Brooks' hair was messy in an admittedly sexy kind of way. Then the words unrealistic, unimaginable, and unpublishable crossed my mind, making me narrow my eyes. It was at this moment that he caught me looking. My cheeks heated, and I cleared my throat. I see you still haven't figured out how to use a brush, Brooks, I said, since it had been a standing joke between us that he was always far too busy reading to bother brushing his hair. It had been our shared love of books, which had brought us together in the first place. Ironic. He raked his fingers through his dark locks and opened his mouth to speak when the elevator doors opened with a ping. We stepped forward and into the offices of Prince and Company. He led the way through the lobby and down a hall, stopping in front of a closed door. Then he opened it and stood back to let me through. As I passed him, I caught the unmistakable smell of last night's cologne, and my stomach did a little flip. No, no, no! So not okay to have that reaction now that I knew Prince Charming was my ex. Please, have a seat, he said. I slid into the leather chair that sat in front of a large desk and set my empty coffee cup down. Piles of manuscripts were stacked neatly on top, but mine couldn't still be there since he had surely shredded the pages and sent them for hamster bedding somewhere. Unrealistic, unimaginable, and unpublishable. My shoulders tensed as I watched him place my laptop carefully on the desk. Then he sat back in his chair, studying me with those startlingly blue eyes, the same eyes that had looked into mine from behind that black mask last night. He took a pair of glasses out of his tweed jacket pocket and slipped them on, making him look like a hot book nerd. Why was life so cruel? You rejected me. I blurted. Rejected you? Brooks asked, a pained look crossing his face. He took off his glasses and rubbed the bridge of his nose before slipping them back on. Michelle, I'm sorry. But that was, what, ten years ago? We broke up nine and a half years ago, actually, and I'm not talking about that. I mean you rejected my manuscript. He looked confused, his eyes scanning the largest pile of papers on his desk which I could only assume was the slush pile. So many dreams dashed probably with his wicked words. What are you talking about? I haven't even seen a manuscript from you. My pen name is Mia Mapleton. Ring any bells? Once upon a date? As I told him my pen name and book title, I noticed that my leg was jiggling up and down, a habit I'd had since I was a kid and which happened when I was nervous or annoyed. Right now, I was both. His eyes widened as realization hit him. Oh. Is that it? Just oh? You know being a novelist is all I ever wanted to be. And when I finally write a book I'm really proud of, you just chuck it in the trash. Seems to be a habit of yours, doesn't it, throwing me away? He stared at me in disbelief and shook his head. Look, let's just separate these two things okay? First, I'm sorry I hurt you back in high school. 
Trust me, Michelle, that was the last thing I wanted to do. But. I wasn't good enough for you. I didn't read the right kind of books for you, did I? It had always been the reason I figured he dumped me, because while Brooks read the classics, I always had my nose in romantic stories of heroes and heroines, and happy ever afters. Brooks looked dumbfounded. What? Michelle, I never said or. I held my hand up. Forget it, okay? I have. Clearly not. I glared at him. Let's just stick to the important stuff. My book. He took a deep breath and stared at me. Then he shook his head, opened a drawer, and took out a stack of papers. This book? My eyes widened. Not shredded, I see. He gave me a look I couldn't read. You're writing as. Mia Mapleton? I nodded, my throat tightening as the rejection went through my mind. I had put my heart and soul into that book. You hated it. No, that's not true, Michelle. The book was good. The writing was excellent, in fact. But it was just, he trailed off, probably finding it hard to be so harsh in person. My heart pounded. It was just what? It was just, unbelievable. Our readers need to be able to believe in our books. Cut the sales talk, Brooks. What is so unbelievable about Once Upon a Date? He slid his glasses down his nose and rubbed his eyes. He looked tired. I was glad. Life just isn't like you put in the story, Michelle. Romance isn't all hearts and flowers, and violins playing. I looked him in the eye. It can be. Not in my opinion. Brooks at least had the decency to look uncomfortable. He set my manuscript back down and switched his attention to my laptop. So, you say this is yours? I nodded. The laptop is mine. This is your sticker? he asked, tapping the high heels. Yes. His expression showed he finally understood. So that means. I let out a sigh. That the fairy tale evening you had last night was with me. And don't even bother trying to deny it was magical, Brooks Keller, because I know you felt it, too. A small smile played on his lips, the same lips, I suddenly remembered, that I had kissed last night. The same lips I had kissed a million times before. Oh. I'm in trouble. You're last naming me. I smiled in spite of myself. Brooks and I'd had our fair share of arguments while we dated, and he always knew when he was in trouble because I would use his full name. Michelle Moss. I can't believe that was you last night, he said, shaking his head in disbelief. Maybe I should have known. I mean, you would think that, er, some things would be so familiar that. You mean like kissing me? I supplied. He nodded. Yes, exactly. How could we not have known? Oh, believe me. I had no idea. I mean. Not a clue. In fact, in a million years I never would have. I get it, he said, holding his hand up and a line formed between his eyebrows. Where did you disappear to after, well, you know? I went to the table to get your laptop, and when I got back to where we'd been standing, you had disappeared. So that was where he'd gone. Family emergency, I said. Everything okay now? I shrugged. Resolved enough. That's good. He nodded and slid the laptop across the desk toward me. Look, I'm sorry about your book, Michelle. But it really was good. Just unbelievable, I pointed out, even though my modern fairy tale romance novel could totally happen in real life. In fact, last night would have made a great chapter too. 
I'll tell you what, he said, clasping his hands in front of him and leaning forward. Rewrite it with real characters in real situations, and I'll take another look. You mean, make it cold and heartless, like you? I grabbed my laptop and stood. I was getting upset again, and I wouldn't give him the satisfaction of seeing me cry. I'd done enough of that over Brooks in my teens. I wasn't going to start again now that I was 27. He stood. I didn't mean to make you upset. I wanted to give you another chance. Well, thanks for nothing, I said, my throat tightening up again. A second chance from him was the last thing I needed. I'd like to say it was nice seeing you again, but I'd rather write a book about wrenches than change one page of my novel to suit your unromantic, unrealistic, and unreadable brain. With that, I calmly strode out the door and headed for the elevator. Despite my bravado, the further I got from his office the harder I had to blink to keep the tears at bay. I stabbed all of the elevator buttons, not caring which floor it took me to, as long as it was away from this one. I stepped inside, ready to have a private moment to fall apart, but just as the door slid closed a hand thrust between them and they opened again. Brooks stepped into the elevator and let the doors close behind him. Great, just great. I kept my gaze on the doors and refused to look his way. He turned to me. Look, Michelle, please don't get me wrong. I loved the book, I really did. And if I were in the market for a modern-day fairy tale, I'd have snapped it up. The descriptions were beautiful, the writing was rich and colorful, and it made me laugh many times. But readers don't want that kind of a romance. They want real life. My eyebrows came together as the elevator gave a cheerful ping and we stopped at the next floor on our way down. That, I believe, is what is called a backhanded compliment. I'm just saying. Your rejection was loud and clear, Brooks, I said, thinking his praise for my writing didn't do anything to lessen the sting. The elevator door closed and we were moving again. We'll have to agree to disagree because I know that in real life love can be expressed with those grand gestures from my book, just like two masked strangers can find romance at a charity ball. Not us, though, because you weren't exactly forthcoming about being an editor who's pessimistic about love. Ping! We stopped at the next floor and the elevator doors opened. You didn't tell me you were an author, he said. Whatever, I said pounding on the button until the doors closed again. Then I moved back and glared at him. The point is that the evening was all fake. Not real. Fantasy, he said, holding my gaze. Just like fairy tales, he said, and to my horror he produced my manuscript from behind his back. My eyes widened as he flipped through the pages and let them fall open somewhere in the middle. If there was one thing I hated, it was when people read my work aloud. Well, unless it was to praise it, which I knew wasn't going to happen with Mr. Negative here. I held up my hands. Please spare me. I need to give you examples to help you understand. Ping! I understand plenty, I said, wishing I hadn't pressed all of those floors. What had I been thinking? Here, for instance, he said, sounding annoyingly excited. Your hero and heroine are in a subway elevator somewhere in New York when the elevator suddenly stops and they realize they are stuck in it together, just the two of them. I shrugged. So? It happens. He raised an eyebrow, a gesture I remembered well. When? When does that ever happen in real life? As if on cue, the elevator shuddered, and then came to a sudden stop. A jolt of electricity blasted my chest. Oh, no. Did I ever mention I get claustrophobic? He looked at me accusingly. You did that on purpose. What? With the power of my mind? You must have pressed the emergency stop button. I put my hands on his arms and moved him to one side. 
Well, seeing as the buttons are all behind you and I had no way of reaching them, I'd say either you press the stop button, or this elevator just proved my book right. The incredulous look on his face told me all I needed to know and I laughed, not quite sure whether to gloat or go into full claustrophobia panic mode. Chapter 5 Don't worry, the elevator will start up again in a minute. Brooks thrust his hands to his hips, even while clutching my manuscript still, and started pacing, as much as one can pace in a small metal box, from one side of the elevator to the other. It's temperamental sometimes. Must be related to you then. I blew out a large breath, blowing wisps of blonde hair, which had worked their way loose from my bun. He gave me a questioning look. Why are you mad at me for telling my honest opinion? I'm not, I lied, hating that the walls of the elevator were mirrored. No matter where I stood, I couldn't escape my reflection, and red-faced, sweaty, and stress was not a sight that filled me with joy. If I wanted Brooks to think he had no effect on me, this look was not going to pass that off. Brooks finally sank against the wall and slid down to the floor until he was in a sitting position. He stretched one leg out straight in front of him and kept the other one bent to his chest, with his right forearm resting on his bent knee. You used to sit like that when we'd meet under the tree, I trailed off, my words bringing me back to a past that I wanted to forget. He smiled. You remember our tree? I nodded, staring down at him. You would read for hours there, while I wrote stories and daydreamed about being an author one day. His email rejection came to mind, causing me to stop reminiscing about the old days. Also, were the walls closing in a little? This suddenly felt like the Disneyland elevator at the haunted mansion and I waited for the wicked voice to start laughing. Claustrophobic much? Me? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Brooks reached up and took my hand, tugging on it. Look. We may be here a while, so you may as well make yourself comfortable. I suppose you're right. I settled down beside him and leaned against the wall. His gaze flicked to mine. About the book. My brow furrowed. Now you can't deny that it was true to life. Come on, Michelle, he said, giving me a side glance. The writing was good but the romance aspect was unrealistic. I raised an eyebrow. Oh, really? Because elevators don't break down, right? Yet, here we are. What are the chances? He shook his head. It's a coincidence. Nothing more. I folded my arms. There are no coincidences. He turned to look at me, wearing a mischievous look on his face. Okay, let's go with your theory for a minute. If your book is so realistic, then that would make me the hero, right? I snorted. More like the antagonist. And it would make you the heroine, yes? I nodded. I could get behind that part. So, according to the book, right about now, he flicked through my manuscript until he got to the right chapter. I would be looking deep into your eyes. My eyes bulged. Please don't do that. You'll scare me. And as I look into your eyes, I would. His finger ran along some lines on the manuscript page until he tapped the end of a sentence. I would tell you that I could hear your heart beating. My cheeks heated. I know what it says. But you claim this could actually happen in real life, he said, pushing his glasses up his nose with his index finger. The elevator stopped unexpectedly. I'll give you that. Now it's my turn to say that my heart is beating just for you. My belly did a little flip. And? I'm demonstrating my point, he said, folding the manuscript and tapping it against his palm. Would that line do it for you? Not if you said it, I said, willing the flutter in my belly to chill out. My gaze dropped to his lips, making me think about our kiss last night. But if someone heroic said those words to me then yes. 
I'd think it was incredibly romantic. You would? Huh. He shot me an incredulous look and then opened the manuscript again. Okay, then what if I said, I can make your heart beat even faster if you will only give me the opportunity? My heart rate kicked up a little further, but only because he had a soothing voice. Not because I had an interest in him saying those words to me for real. I bit my lower lip, suddenly remembering he used to love me doing that. As if on cue, he glanced down at my mouth. And then, I would move in ever so slowly and your eyes would slide down to my lips. Hang on, I protested, putting my hand up. His words sounded hypnotic and it felt like he was putting me into some kind of a trance with his gentle voice and seductive words. And then. I would do this. His mouth moved toward mine. My eyes fluttered closed for a moment, before I snapped them open again and thrust a finger to his chest. Hey! He blinked through hooded lids. What? Did I get it wrong? Yes. If this were my story, I would be stuck in this elevator with my hero, which clearly isn't you. I scrambled to my feet, just to gain more space from him before he tempted me again. You don't think I could be the hero of a novel? He grinned, standing up. You seemed to think differently last night when you kissed me. Well, that was because I thought you were someone else. The corner of his mouth lifted. Ah, but maybe your heart knew, even if your head didn't. Or, maybe I had too much champagne. As I recall you barely had one glass. I'm a rare drinker, I lied, loving the annoyed look that appeared on his face. He put his hand on my shoulder. Michelle, I really am sorry for hurting you all those years ago. I did what I thought was right at the time, and, well, there have been many times since when I've given myself a good talking to about my choices. My heart warmed, touched by his apology. It was a long time ago. Maybe it's time we catch up? he suggested. Not like we have anything else to do, I said, giving him a small smile. The years fell away as the minutes ticked by, with Brooks filling me in on all the things he'd been up to since high school. I made him laugh with tales of my various part-time jobs, including a stint teaching creative writing at a local adult school where the students refused to take me seriously. It was as if the years had never passed with us apart, and I found myself thinking that maybe, after almost ten years, it was time to forgive and forget, although the way Brooks kept looking at me made it awfully hard to think straight at all. I'm sorry the students gave you such a hard time at the adult school, Michelle, but you have to admit, those freckles do make you look young. And, hey, if you choose to make those changes to make your novel publishable then I'm sure you'll get taken a bit more seriously at the school. And with that the spell was broken. Just as I opened my mouth to tell him what he could do with his changes, the elevator jolted back to life and within seconds the doors opened on the ground floor. So, I walked out without giving Brooks a backward glance, calling a casual goodbye over my shoulder as I headed down the bustling downtown sidewalk and away from Brooks and his kissable lips. Michelle, where are you going? Brooks called out to me a minute after I'd left him. I turned around and spotted him weaving through the pedestrians on the sidewalk, hurrying to catch up with me. What the? Michelle, would you listen for just a minute? He hurried over until he was beside me, looking a little flustered. What more do I need to hear, Brooks? We just spent an hour stuck together in an elevator. I believe we've said all we needed to say. Things were going fine. Why are you so upset now? he asked, a tiny line forming between his eyebrows. I don't understand. I said I would give you a book deal if. Yes, you did. I stopped abruptly and turned to look at him. If I wrote a decent book. Gee, what a compliment. He blew out a breath. I didn't say the word decent. Your book already is decent. It's great, actually. 
I started toward my favorite coffee cart. But? But like I said, it's just not realistic, he said, moving to catch up with me. If you could just argh. I gasped as Brooks stumbled backward on the sidewalk. His legs seemed to have gotten tangled up in a very sparkly leash that had a familiar dog attached to the other end, who was wearing a tiny sparkly doggy t-shirt. Good boy, Atticus. I bent down to stroke the dog's curly coat and smiled up at Courtney Carmichael, barista extraordinaire and the dog's owner. I watched with amusement as Brooks worked to disentangle himself from the leash. I gave the dog a frowny face. Did that mean old man startle you? Mean old man? Courtney looked from me to Brooks and then back to me again, wearing a surprised expression. He usually brings Atticus treats all the time. Did I miss something, Brooks? Michelle and I were stuck in the elevator for an hour together, he said, using a deadpan voice, as if that explained everything. Ah, Courtney said, in an understanding way that made me wonder what exactly she understood. Nice tea on Atticus, I said, noting the little poodle mix was wearing a shirt to rival Courtney's own sparkly shirt. Her pooch's t-shirt read, Be the person your dog thinks you are, spelled out in blue and silver sparkly beads. I see Atticus has the same fashion sense as you, Courtney. She fed a dog biscuit to Atticus under the cart. Of course, only the best for my boy. Brooks finally disentangled himself from the leash and then crouched down in front of Atticus, scratching him behind the ears. Atticus half closed his eyes with bliss, and when Brooks stopped, the dog nudged him with his head to do it again. I couldn't help but swoon a little as Brooks gathered the dog up in his arms and cuddled him, apologizing in a soft soothing voice for tripping over him a moment before. I had to remind myself this was not Prince Charming, this was Prince Rejection. Courtney gave me a weird look and then handed me my usual coffee drink. You need another? I'm sure you're stressing over Philip still. I took the coffee gratefully. Like usual, huh? She laughed. Honey, any day with a Y in it will have that boy doing something that drives you up the wall, but on this occasion you seem more bothered than usual. I nodded. Yes, I've hit my wall with my stepbrother. I can't keep bailing him out. Any luck finding your laptop? Courtney asked, looking Brooks up and down, albeit discreetly. To be fair, Brooks was so enamored with the dog that he wouldn't have noticed anyway, a trait I found very attractive, much to my annoyance. I'll tell you later, I mouthed to her and she nodded. Your dog is awesome, Courtney, Brooks said, setting Atticus back down again. Thanks, I agree. Courtney beamed, always proud when someone praised her dog. I got him a while back from Reagan's rescue at the barn. This little dude needed a forever home, and I needed a man I could trust. She laughed to show she was joking about the last part. One day, when I'm more settled, I'll head down to the rescue and get a dog of my own. Brooks leaned down to pat the dog's head again. Courtney finished making a coffee for a man wearing a suit. She handed him the cup, smiled and then turned to me. So, Philip? I shook my head. Yes, he's forgotten to pay his rent for the past few months, so I need to find about nine grand to pay it for him. Brooks frowned. Why do you have to pay someone else's rent? I sipped my coffee. Because he's my stepbrother, and I co-signed the lease. Brooks paused for a moment. Well, I could pay you a $10,000 advance on a book deal, if you can make the changes I request. Deal? Courtney's face lit up as she looked from me to Brooks and back again. Book deal? What have I missed? I realized I hadn't explained this annoying situation. I'm sorry, Courtney. You seem to know Brooks Keller. Well, he also happens to be an old high school, er, friend. I see, she said, squinting at me as if trying to decipher more. 
I kept my expression blank. I submitted my beloved manuscript to him at Prince and Company and as the editor he rejected it, calling it unrealistic, unimaginable, and unpublishable. Ouch, she said, turning to Brooks. It was well written, with fresh ideas and great character development, Brooks said. None of which he mentioned in the rejection email, so that's all news to me, I said, my stomach clenching. Courtney turned to me again. Hmm. But the romance aspect was. I'm afraid, unrealistic, Brooks said. I pointed a finger at him. You know, maybe if you take the time to write all of that positive feedback to an author instead of your rude rejection letter then it wouldn't have felt like I should throw my laptop in the toilet. Courtney cringed, holding out a coffee to Brooks. Thanks. He took the cup from Courtney. I try to give constructive criticism, so the writer can make their novel better. I wasn't trying to discourage anyone, but the truth is what it is. And I didn't say you had to rewrite the whole novel, just make the romance part more, true to life. Less happy ever after and more happy just for now in a realistic way. Courtney raised her cup. I hear that. I mock glared at her. I don't agree. Love can be like you say, but for others it can also be filled with insta connection, heartfelt romantic moments, which end up in permalove. Courtney snorted. Brooks chuckled, glancing at her. Right? You two are jaded. I crossed my arms, which was, well, not comfortable while holding my coffee cup. I'm not changing a perfect romance storyline to suit your cynical guidelines, Brooks Keller. Courtney tapped her finger to her temple while Brooks and I sipped our coffees and simultaneously glared at one another in silence. Finally, she snapped her fingers. Okay, well, there's one way to sort this problem out once and for all. Want to hear it? We both stopped drinking and looked at her expectantly. It's simple. Put the book to the test. I looked at Brooks and then at Courtney, not grasping what she meant. Huh? A little experiment to see who's right and who's wrong. I'll do anything to prove to her I'm right, he said. You can't prove something that isn't true, I pointed out. Here's what you do, Courtney said, holding up two fists as if she were trying to contain her excitement. Follow Michelle's book to the letter. If the romance works out the way you say it will, Michelle, then you get the book deal, with no amendments needed. She lifted Atticus off the pavement and cuddled him. And if the romance doesn't work out after following the book, as Brooks claims it won't in real life, then, Michelle, you rewrite the scenes with Brooks' more cynical details. I squinted, not quite getting what she meant. Um, huh? Seriously? Do I have to spell it out? She asked. I nodded. I think you do, yes. Courtney sighed dramatically. Look, you and Brooks follow the chapters of the book, to the letter, and if Brooks falls in love with you then you get the book deal just as your book is written. However, she held her hands up as Brooks and I both tried to interrupt at the same time, if Brooks doesn't fall for you then you have to make the changes he wants. Either way, you get your book deal and receive the money you need to bail Philip out. Again. I was horrified at how logical that sounded. But, I don't want Brooks to fall in love with me, which he will, obviously, because the plot is that good. Courtney shrugged. But if that's true then you get the book deal you've always dreamed about. Hold on just a minute, Brooks said, adjusting his glasses and raking a hand through his hair. There's no way a reenactment will work, because... I'm sorry to keep pointing this out, Michelle, but the romance in your book is totally unrealistic. Courtney shrugged again. Then you have nothing to lose, either, Brooks. Because if you're right then you get your way and acquire the book the way you want it. Interesting, he said, taking another sip of coffee. 
I would obviously win this deal, because I have absolute faith in my book, and it's true that the advance would solve the trouble with Philip's debt. I looked at Brooks, with a satisfied smile on my face. I mean, what did I care if Brooks fell in love with me? Maybe it was his turn to have a broken heart. Not that I wanted his feelings to be hurt, but it would be fitting in a karma sort of way. I held out my right hand. I'm up for the challenge if you are. You're on, Michelle, Brooks said, taking my hand and shaking it. But do me a favor and don't be a sore loser, okay? I laughed. Oh, the pain will be all yours, my friend. I guarantee it. Chapter 6 As I walked through the gold double doors of the Jeffreys Hotel, heading to the lounge to meet my friends for a drink, memories of the masquerade ball flooded my mind and made me smile. I passed the concierge desk and crossed the lobby, spotting the double doors of the ballroom across the way, a sense of deja vu hitting me like a tsunami. Touching my lips with my fingers, my smile dropped as I remembered how Brooks had gone from hero to zero literally overnight. Still, that kiss lingered in my mind, though. Earth to Michelle, come in Michelle. Do you copy? Krista asked, waving her hands in front of my face and I laughed. Read you loud and clear, bass. Is Missy here yet? I peeked over Krista's shoulder to see if my roommate had arrived yet, but I couldn't see her. I had known Missy since my childhood days in Blue Moon Bay on the coast. After we moved to Sacramento last year, she and Krista had hit it off immediately when they met, meaning we all spent a lot of time together. Missy sent a text that she's already in the lounge, Krista said. Hopefully, with three chilled cocktails making rings on the coasters as we speak. I laughed again. No matter how stressed I was, spending time with the girls always lifted my spirits. Friends were essential in life. Leaving the ballroom behind, I followed Krista to the lounge area, and sure enough there was Missy, having nabbed the best table in the place. Moi, moi. Missy kissed me on both cheeks with exaggerated sound effects, and did the same to Krista before sitting back down. Missy could be a little over the top at times, but, she was an ex-supermodel and it suited her bubbly personality. The lounge at the Jeffreys Hotel wasn't quite as opulent as the ballroom, but it was a stunning venue and one of our favorite places for a night out, because it wasn't as loud as the usual bars and clubs in town. This was a great place for catching up and girl talk. I sank down into a navy blue and gold patterned chair, its deep mahogany arms polished to the same high standard as the doors and wood panels. I smiled and held a hand up at the familiar bartender, who was waving hello to us. That's a surefire way to know we come here way too often, Missy said, handing me a cocktail, a creamy-looking concoction of goodness knows what, but it tasted divine when I took a sip. I licked a sweet drop off my bottom lip and images of the masquerade ball, or more specifically the kiss with Prince Charming, immediately invaded my mind. You're blushing, Michelle. Do you think the bartender is hot, or something? Krista winked at Missy, and they both looked at me expectantly. What? Oh, please. He's like half my age. Cougar, Krista declared. Can you be a cougar at 27? I asked. Can he be half your age at 27 if he's a bartender? Missy asked. Well, he looks 21. Too young for my taste. Krista shrugged. If anyone can pull off being a 27-year-old cougar then it's you. Or you, Missy. Nick happens to be older than me by a couple of years and I'm beyond happy with my fiancé, thank you very much, Missy said, glancing at the enormous sparkle on her ring finger. You two are perfectly adorable, Krista said, smiling at Missy before turning to me. But let's get back to the reason Michelle is blushing. I'm not blushing, it's the reflection of the lights. I gestured up at the ornate golden ceiling, where extravagant chandeliers hung, the crimson crystal droplets casting a magical hue over the entire lounge. Fine, 
Don't tell us. We'll discover your secret eventually. We always do, and you know that. Missy twisted her mouth in a whatever kind of way, and turned to Krista. So, how's life at the travel agency? She rolled her eyes. Well, let's just say it's never dull. We had this woman come in to book a holiday to Florida at Christmas. She asked about essentials to bring and I suggested sunscreen. She got very annoyed with me and asked if I thought she was stupid. She didn't, I said. Krista nodded. Oh, she did. She called my boss and complained that I thought I was better than her just because I got to travel all over the world. I didn't correct her that the farthest I'd traveled was seven hours to Disneyland. But, whatever. Was your boss upset? Missy asked. She shook her head. No, but I think that's only because she's going through some kind of crisis. Midlife, maybe? I don't know. She's been acting weird, though. Like how? Missy asked. My gaze wandered over Missy's shoulder where I caught sight of the door to the ballroom across the way, making me think of the masquerade ball again. How could I have missed that those gorgeous blue eyes behind the mask belonged to Brooks Keller? Maybe because he wore glasses? That couldn't be it, though, because I'd always been mesmerized by his eyes. Maybe because I never thought I'd see him again? What do you think, Michelle? Are you up for it? I jumped as Missy's voice broke through my thoughts. Up for what? Florida? Krista gaped at me. Are you kidding me? We stopped talking about Florida two conversations ago. Missy just told us in detail about her fashion party where we all dressed to the nines. Oh, I bit my bottom lip. Oops. Missy owned Fashionably Late, a high-end clothing boutique, which sold the most beautiful clothes. My mind immediately went to the fact that Fashionably Late was where I had picked up my dress for the masquerade ball. My thoughts started to drift back to that night yet again. Missy snapped her fingers in front of my eyes. So? I asked if you would like to come to my fashion party. It will be very high-end. You can get your dress from my store, or wherever. Krista's coming. I'm going to rope Courtney into coming, too, if I can persuade her out of her sparkly tees. I opened my mouth to protest, but Krista jumped in. Please say yes, Michelle. It will be a blast, and you looked absolutely gorgeous in that number from the masquerade ball. This time, a mention of the ball caused my mind to flash back to Brooks leading me onto the dance floor and holding me around my waist as the theme song from Beauty and the Beast began to play. I could almost smell his cologne and feel his warm breath on my cheek. All right, Michelle. This is an inter-friend tie-in. What is going on with you tonight? You keep disappearing, Krista said. I frowned. What? I haven't left the lounge all evening. Well, your mind has, and some would say it's too scattered to be let out by itself at the moment. What gives? I laughed at first, but then dropped my head into my hands and groaned. Okay, there's this guy. I knew it! Krista clapped her hands in a rapid manner. Prince Charming from the ball, right? I told Missy all about him earlier. I frowned. How did you know? Besides the fact that I interrupted you two kissing outside the dance floor? My cheeks heated. Oh, right. You two were the talk of the night, anyway, Krista said, as if this were old news. Nobody would have been surprised if you'd left in a pumpkin carriage. People were seriously talking about me? I asked, grimacing. Well, that's embarrassing. We're done waiting, Michelle, Missy said, raising a finger and signaling to the bartender for another round of drinks. Tell us everything. 
It was time, so I told the girls the whole story, starting with Brooks and I dating in high school to when we broke up, to meeting Prince Charming at the ball, and then finding out he was the editor at my favorite publishing company who had shot my book down. And now I've been roped into this romance book challenge that Courtney suggested. We follow the novel to the letter, and if Brooks falls in love with me, then he publishes my book as it is without my having to make any changes. And if he doesn't fall in love with me, then I agree to the changes and he'll publish my book. Krista clapped her hands together. Yay, that's so exciting. You get a book deal either way. That's what Courtney said, but it's not that simple. See, I believe in my book and I don't want to make any changes. If this bet doesn't go according to my plan, I'll have to cut out all the best parts of my novel. What a dilemma, Missy said, as the bartender set down our second round of drinks. Speaking of plans, I lifted another creamy-looking drink and looked at Krista. I need a favor. Can I borrow your apartment one evening? Her eyebrows drew together. Sure, but why? I looked from Missy to Krista and then smiled. Because your apartment has a fire escape, and I need one. Krista rolled her hand toward herself. Again, I ask, why? I took a sip of my cocktail and savored the taste before answering. Because, dear ladies, chapter 2 is why. Oh, yes, I rubbed my hands together in a mock fiendish manner. After Brooks and I act out Chapter 2, that book deal will be mine. Mwahahaha. Chapter 7 Even though I had written the modern-day fairy tale romance novel, Once Upon a Date, myself and pretty much had it memorized, I still read and reread the chapter to make sure every single detail was correct. There was no way I was letting Brooks win on a technicality. He seemed adamant that the romance in my story couldn't happen in real life. So, if, when, he did fall in love with me, there was no way I would let him wiggle out of our deal by claiming I hadn't kept to the script. On the other hand, would he try and get off on a technicality? The Brooks I knew had integrity and I'd like to think he hadn't changed. I mean, he had certainly displayed gentlemanly tendencies at the ball. But could that all have been an act? I didn't think so, but then, who knows? It wasn't like I'd expected him to dump me out of nowhere before graduation day. Krista had agreed to let me take over her apartment for the evening, and, with a few adjustments, the scene was set. This was not totally surprising, as I had written the fictional scene with Krista's place in mind for Chapter 2. I checked my phone for the umpteenth time, almost hoping that Brooks had left a message to say he couldn't make it. I was excited and nervous all at the same time. After all, this was more than just a fake date. This was my future career on the line. But the cell screen was blank, with no missed calls and no texts. The game was on. I took a deep breath. Okay, it was five breaths, and finally time to put my plan into action. Not wanting to set Krista's apartment on fire, or even have it smelling of smoke, I took the box of incense sticks from my bag and set them up on the windowsill, before carefully lighting each one. By the time I had lit the tenth one, the first was half burned. A big cloud of smoke was building, so I opened the window a crack, allowing the fragrant smoke to billow out into the evening air. It was exactly seven o'clock, which meant Brooks should be sauntering past down on the street at this precise moment. Biting my bottom lip, I looked out the window, my belly bubbling with anticipation. When I spotted Brooks below, my stomach did a cartwheel and I smiled. There he was, looking up at the window, his hand over his eyes to shield him from the streetlights. Hello? he asked, using a loud voice. Are you okay? Ma'am, do you need help? That voice using those words from my novel sent shivers up my spine. I shook my head to clear the thoughts. I had to stick to the plan. I leaned out of the window and felt the incense tickling my throat. Yes, I'm fine. Thank you for asking. 
It's only a little fire, I just need to, I started to cough, the rest of the words lost as I spluttered and choked on the thick scent from a stick, which, multiplied times ten, was actually starting to make me feel sick. In the book, the heroine actually sets fire to a pan on the stove, but the origin of the smoke didn't matter to the interaction between the hero and the heroine. Plus, I doubt Krista would appreciate it if I started a real fire in her kitchen. Ma'am, would you like me to call the fire department? He asked, sticking perfectly to the script. I downed a glass of water and poked my head out of the window again. No, really, it looks worse than it is. I stared at Brooks standing in the street, my heart thumping. Maybe the incense had some kind of hallucinogenic effect because he looked more handsome than I'd ever seen him and exactly how I'd described the hero in the book. I clapped my hands over my mouth as it dawned on me that I had subconsciously based my hero on Brooks long before I bumped into him again. I guess the saying is true that you never forget your first love. Fanning the smoke with a towel, I waited for the next part of the chapter, and right on cue, Brooks had appeared above the windowsill, his nose wrinkling at the smell. W. What are you doing here? I asked, putting my hand over my heart. You didn't need to climb all the way up the fire escape to rescue me. It's dangerous. You could have fallen. He climbed in through the window and raked his fingers through his hair. I couldn't walk away from this fire, not when you're trapped here. I swallowed hard, partly through nerves and partly because I could feel another coughing fit coming on. In my book, the hero then dashes to the stove and extinguishes the flames, before throwing open all the windows and doors. Instead, Brooks removed all the incense sticks and ran them underwater before throwing them in the trash, which had the same effect. Thank you for putting out the fire. How can I repay you? Would you like to? I mean, I was just about to cook dinner. Would you like to join me? Brooks, still in character, grinned. I'll join you on one condition. Which is? He stole a glance at the manuscript, which was open on the table. That you let your hair down and relax. You've had a tough night. Why don't you go and take a shower and get rid of the smoke on your clothes? I'll go and pick up some Chinese food. Chinese food is my favorite. How did you know? I asked, smiling. I stayed in the shower way longer than I needed to because I knew how busy the restaurant at the end of the street got on a Friday night. I took my time getting ready until I heard Brooks arrive back into the apartment. When I went into the kitchen, though, there was no sign of Brooks. I wandered into the living room and found him outside on the fire escape. Krista's little side table had been set up on the tiny balcony and candles burned in glass holders. Two place settings had been set. Brooks opened a bottle of wine and was about to pour it into the wine glasses when he saw me standing there. This isn't how the book. I know, he said shaking his head. I went a little off script because, honestly, it seemed like the smell of that stuff was bothering your throat. I figured there's no way you could eat inside. Oh, how thoughtful, I said, but then I frowned. This doesn't mean the deal's going to be off when I win because you've changed the scenery, right? You know I wouldn't do something like that, he said, and I breathed a sigh of relief. Besides, you won't be winning. We'll see, Brooks. Yes, we will see, he said, flashing a grin that made those blue eyes sparkle. We got back on script, and even though it was a fake fictional date, this dinner was one of the most romantic dates I'd ever had. I struggled with separating fact from fiction as Brooks laughed at my stories from my childhood as he gazed into my eyes. So, tell me about you now. I said, because, in the book, the heroine asks her rescuer about his life, and as he opens up to her, she finds herself falling in love with him. I had a happy childhood. Then I grew up, went to college, and fell in love. I realized I was holding my breath as he talked, so I let it out gently so he wouldn't notice. And, what happened to her? 
He stared at one of the candles on the table, looking deep in thought, and I watched as the flames danced in his eyes. He took a sip of wine and then set the glass down again, his jaw tightening. I lost her. Even though the line was from the book, his tone made me think he was talking about me. My eyes suddenly watered. He took my hand, rubbing his thumb gently across my skin. I was a fool. She was everything to me. I thought I was doing the right thing by letting her go, but I was wrong. Did she love you, too? He nodded. Very much. My throat tightened. Then why would you ruin what you had? At this point in the book, I merely wrote that the hero explained to the heroine his reasons for breaking up with his girl. So, I waited for Brooks to move on to the next bit of dialogue. Instead, he said, she wanted to be with me so much that she was prepared to give up her college scholarship to follow me. I couldn't let her do that. I couldn't let her sacrifice her future for me, so I broke up with her, for her sake. I swallowed hard, wondering if he was talking about us, Brooks and Michelle, and not the characters in the book. Did you tell her that was the reason? I asked, since Brooks had never told me why he'd broken things off suddenly. No, I couldn't tell her, or she might have tried to talk me out of it. Instead, I let her go. I'll never make that mistake again, he said, his blue eyes fixed on my gaze. As I sat staring at him in shock, Brooks leaned across the table and stopped inches from my mouth. Then he caressed my cheek and kissed me. I closed my eyes and leaned into him, the feel of his lips on mine so familiar and yet so exciting. Then he stopped, exactly as I had written it at the very end of chapter 2, and he sat back in his chair. My heart was thumping. Not in a good way as if I were sure I had won the challenge. My heart pounded due to the way Brooks had looked at me, talked to me, and kissed me. There was no denying that all of the chemistry and feelings between us were still there. At that moment, I felt confident that Brooks would fall in love with me, if he hadn't already. And I knew how I still felt about him, after all these years. I smiled, picturing my book launch party, with Brooks by my side, not just as my publisher but also as my boyfriend. Wow, I said. Emotion flooded his face, his gaze locked on mine. But then he took a deep breath, drained the rest of the wine, and set the glass back down. He cleared his throat. So, what cheesy, unrealistic date are you going to drag me on next? I blinked. Um, what? He looked me straight in the eye. Whatever you've got in store, I'm up for it. Just one step closer to publishing your book my way, which will bring more sales. You'll see. My heart stopped. He'd only been acting after all, even though I'd been so sure of his feelings in that kiss. No matter. Two could play at this game. I finished off my glass and smiled sweetly at him, more determined than ever to win. Chapter 8 A few days later I was waiting for Brooks to arrive for our next fictional date. It was a beautiful day, with the blue sky broken only by a few fluffy white clouds dotted here and there. As a thank you for rescuing me from the fire at Krista's apartment, I packed a picnic and we were going to take a trip on a rowboat made for two, per my book. I smoothed down my dress and rubbed my arms. Sticking to the storyline in my book, I put on a white bordery anglaise number, with short puffy sleeves, a sweetheart neckline, and a frothy skirt, which fell to just below my knees. Paired with simple blue flats, the outfit felt perfect for a sunny day on the river. A slight breeze brushed across me and I rubbed my arms again, wishing I'd had the heroine in the book bring a jacket. Hi. Brooke's voice cut through my thoughts, goosebumps rising for an entirely different reason now. Hey, I said, suddenly feeling shy, which was so unlike me, especially with a man I had known practically half my life. Are you ready for our faux date number two? His words stung. I knew he was right about it being a fake date, but still. 
hearing him say it felt wrong. I put a hand to my hip. Look, if you have somewhere else to be. He shook his head. Not a chance, Michelle. You're not going to win this by default. We are sticking to the script 100%. I raised an eyebrow. You're very upbeat today. He took my picnic basket and loaded it into the waiting rowboat in the water, before holding his hand out to me. And why wouldn't I be? I have the afternoon off work and I am in the company of the most beautiful woman in Sacra. I mean, New York. I smiled in spite of my nervousness, but my smile soon faltered as I stepped into the boat, which swayed from side to side, causing me to sit down with a thump. Once out on the Sacramento River, though, I relaxed, enjoying watching Brooks row the boat, his strong muscles flexing under his white t-shirt. He nodded at the skyline. Looks just like Central Park in your book, right? I laughed. Well, this is as good as it's going to get unless you want to drive like 3,000 miles to get to New York. Out here on the water the wind had picked up a little bit and I shivered. Brooks laid the oars on the bottom of the boat and reached behind him for his backpack. Pulling out a turquoise blanket, he handed it to me. I thought you might be cold, so I brought this, he said. My stomach fluttered. For a moment, I wondered why this couldn't be real. Sigh. But I tried to hide my feelings. I smiled, taking the lightweight blanket gratefully and wrapping it around my shoulders, noting that it was big enough for two. Brooks picked up the oars and began rowing again, singing quietly as he did. It don't take a word, not a single word, go on and kiss the girl. The corners of my mouth curved upward. The Little Mermaid? He laughed. Well, it felt like a Disney moment. Ah but is it in my book? He shook his head. Nope, just using a little artistic license. Okay, so back to the script. I thought for a moment. Well, I think it's about now that our hero realizes that he's met the girl of his dreams. Brooks held my gaze for longer than was necessary, and without looking away he said, I think you might be right. But doesn't she realize that he's her, what do you call him in the book? Her perfect bow, too? My cheeks heated at the sweet but old-fashioned phrase, which I loved. When I wrote the book I hadn't realized that my ex-boyfriend and thus far love of my life would be reading it. In the book, yes, she does realize that. A small look of disappointment crossed his face, making my eyebrows come together. So, what's for lunch? He nodded at the picnic basket, one I had searched all over the city to find in order to keep the details as close to the story as possible. It was a traditional wicker basket. The lid opened to reveal a pair of pretty plates, blue and white bone china, of course, along with two of everything else, including a couple of glasses. Bread, cheese, smoked sausage, olives, and, um, I mentally went through my shopping list from the day before. Sun-dried tomatoes, hummus, strawberries, oh, and a bottle of wine. And, lastly, I pulled out a corkscrew from my tote. Tada! He gave me a side glance as he rode. I'm impressed. You really have thought of everything. In fact, there's only one thing missing. My heart skipped a beat as I realized he was back on script. Oh! And what's that? He leaned forward, just as he'd done on the fire escape at Krista's, and lightly pressed his lips to mine. My belly did a little flip and my lips warmed until he abruptly pulled away. Oh, no, he exclaimed. I opened my eyes. Oh, no, huh? Hold on tight, Michelle. This is going to get bumpy. I frowned. Well, I wouldn't say that, I mean, we rarely even argued when we dated before. Seriously, Michelle. Just hold on. 
I looked up in time to see a motorboat zoom past us, leaving wave after wave in its wake, waves which were heading right for our boat. For some reason unknown to man, I panicked and stood up. The blanket Brooks had given to me fell around my feet and the boat swayed violently. Then Brooks stood, too, holding out his hand to steady me. But as I took a step toward him, my foot caught in the blanket and I tripped, the entire world standing still for a second as I fell sideways. Brooks' horrified expression was the last thing I saw before I splashed unceremoniously into the water. When I resurfaced, rubbing my eyes, Brooks' expression went from horror to amusement in a split second. He held his hand out. Let me help you. No, I can do this. I don't need help. I spluttered, ignoring his hand and grabbing hold of the side of the boat. Michelle, wait, no. Don't grab the, the rest of the word was drowned out, quite literally, as Brooks landed with a splash beside me, and the boat flipped over sending my picnic basket into the river. Out of nowhere, a clap of thunder heralded the arrival of the rain, which was when I noticed that the fluffy white clouds from earlier were now ominously heavy and gray. I knew Brooks was a good swimmer, so I wasn't worried about him, but I was a bit worried about how he would react to me dunking him in the river. He surfaced, rubbed his eyes and stared at me for what felt like a full minute before swimming the few feet toward me. Treading water, I braced for his annoyance by closing my eyes. My eyes opened sharply as I felt his lips on mine. Only this time it wasn't a light and feathery kiss. This time, his mouth claimed mine. I opened my mouth and we tasted each other, hungry and devouring. I'd missed this. I'd missed him. But then I remembered why we'd ended. How he'd hurt me. I pulled back abruptly, noticing over his shoulder that a small crowd had gathered on the bank to watch as the rescue boat drew near. Without a look at Brooks, I swam for the boat. The spectators cheered as we were pulled aboard, and warm blankets were wrapped around us. Once we were seated on the back of the boat, I dared to glance at Brooks. His blue eyes were on mine. I've missed you, Michelle. More than even I knew, he said. My belly unwittingly fluttered at his words. Then he kissed me again and again, even though that most definitely was not in the book. Chapter 9 After giving us towels so we could dry off and making sure we weren't suffering from hypothermia, the rescue crew dropped us off on the riverbank. I assumed that meant the date that wasn't a date was over, even though my lips were still tingling from his kisses. Brooks held out his hand to me. So, where to now? Well, the picnic basket is at the bottom of the river. But I don't think we're dressed for dinner, do you? I laughed to hide my nervousness, my teeth chattering as the rain continued pelting down. He reached for my hand, lacing his fingers through mine. Come on, we need to get out of this rain before we both catch pneumonia. I glanced down at our entwined fingers. Okay. We ran from tree to tree along the riverbank, trying to stay out of the deluge as much as possible until we ran out of trees. Making a dash for the street, Brooks spotted a cab coming our way and flagged it. He waited in the rain while I climbed in, before taking a seat next to me. The cab driver didn't look too thrilled about having his seat soaked, but he seemed mollified with the rather large tip Brooks gave him when we got out several minutes later. It's a good thing I had my wallet in my pocket instead of my backpack, Brooks said, as the cab drove off. We walked along the sidewalk and people were hurrying, trying to avoid the heavy rain, which we Californians so rarely got to enjoy. Brooks and I looked around, trying to decide where to go. We couldn't get any wetter than we already were, but I was dying to warm up. We both spotted it at the same time, an old-fashioned bookstore, nestled in between a cafe and a clothing boutique. The bookstore's windows were crammed with piles of books enticingly labeled as Book of the Week, or Best Seller, or Local Author. I couldn't help hoping that last category would be me someday. 
Brooks and I looked at each other, and I wondered if he were thinking the same two things, one, that there was no better place to warm up than a cozy bookstore, and two, that one day maybe my book would be displayed in that window. He held my hand and we made a dash across the street, dodging traffic as we ran. The heavy rain had created huge puddles beside the sidewalk. I grimaced at the thought of my feet getting another soaking but I needed to get up off the street. Brooks stood with one foot in the street and the other on the sidewalk and suddenly lifted me into his arms and carried me over the puddle. Finally, he set me down on the sidewalk but didn't remove his hands from my waist. We stood like that, in the rain, with his arms around me and me looking up at him, rainwater dripping from his hair as it fell into his eyes. I reached up and brushed the hair away from his face, smiling at him even though we were getting drenched. The bookstore door opened with an old-fashioned tinkle as someone left, and we took the opportunity to dash inside, where the warmth immediately enveloped us. Walking into a bookstore was like coming home. I stood still for a moment, breathing in the unmistakable scent of old books and leather chairs. Biblicker, he said. I looked up at Brooks. What did you say? Biblicker. It's a word I once read about that describes the smell of old books. Biblis means books, obviously, and Icor is something about blood running through the veins of the gods. Anyway, I read about it once and it stayed with me. That's what you were noticing, right? Yes, I wondered how this man, who I hadn't seen for almost a decade, could come back into my life and read my thoughts so well. The owner of the store came hurrying over and introduced herself as Hilda. She was an older woman with long, gray hair and thick-rimmed glasses. My dears, you must be freezing. Please, come and sit by the heater to get warm. Thank you. Brooks said, slipping his arm around me. I'm afraid it's not the ambience of a fireplace because she swept her arm around to indicate the thousands of books which would burn in minutes. But the heater will still warm you up and hopefully go a long way toward drying you off. We followed her through a labyrinth of bookshelves until we found ourselves in a quiet corner of the store, right at the back, where an electric heater oscillated slowly back and forth, sending out a gentle wave of heat. Two oxblood leather Chesterfield chairs sat in front of the heater, angled so that they were half facing each other, a low mahogany coffee table to the side so as not to block the heat. This corner of the store was my idea of heaven. Let me get you something to warm you, a coffee perhaps, or a hot chocolate. I always keep something in the back, Hilda hurried away before we had a chance to refuse, leaving us standing facing each other. Brooks grinned. It's like being back in high school. I finished, because I'd been thinking the same thing. Some of our happiest times had been spent in bookstores and libraries when we were teenagers, and almost all of our dates had ended up in one or the other. Sometime during the course of the next two hours, Brooks had migrated to the floor in front of my chair, the way he'd always had, and was engrossed in Catcher in the Rye, a book he'd read many times in school. I, on the other hand, was curled up in my chair, reading Little Women, delighting, as I always had, in the adventures of Joe, Meg, Beth, and Amy. I absent-mindedly played with Brooke's hair, which had dried in curls around his neck. I was finding out that this man was a hard habit to break. I'm very sorry, but I need to close up now. Hilda's voice made us both jump, and I was amazed, and a little embarrassed, to see that we had been sitting in the store for more than two hours. It was as it had always been with Brooks, me, and books. We would get lost in each other and the stories we were reading, and time would just fly. Brooks jumped up from the floor and pulled me gently to my feet. As I yawned and stretched, reluctant to leave the warmth of the heater, I could hear Brooks and Hilda talking and laughing. I slipped my feet back into my blue shoes and joined them as they stood at the door. Thanking the woman profusely for her kindness, we stepped outside into the early evening, which was now thankfully dry. I yawned again. Bored? he asked, with a chuckle. Not at all. I shook my head as we strolled down the sidewalk. 
In fact, I was so comfortable and relaxed that I could have stayed there all night, I said, noticing his hand had found mine again. I stopped walking and turned to face him. Thank you. He looked down at me, his eyes twinkling. For what? I stood on tiptoes and kissed his cheek. For the best non-date ever. You're welcome. And he handed me a paper bag that I hadn't even noticed he'd been holding in his other hand. I hope you will like this memento of our best non-date ever. What did you do? My heart rate kicked up as I opened the bag. I pulled out the copy of Little Women, which I had been reading. I looked up at him with tears in my eyes. That's the most romantic gift I've ever received. Thank you. He smiled and draped his arm around my shoulders, the way he had done ten years ago. But as we began to walk again, I spotted something that made me stop in my tracks. All of the stores we'd passed were closed, except the one we were standing outside, the high-end men's clothing store, Taylor and Sons. The lights were on inside and a salesperson was scanning labels into the register for a customer, who I recognized immediately. My gaze dropped to the huge pile of clothes that were being folded and wrapped in tissue paper, before being placed carefully inside bags. Philip! I exclaimed. Brooks looked at me and then followed my gaze to the store, where my stepbrother was handing over a credit card to the cashier, who took it with a smile. Philip? As in, you have to pay $9,000 in back rent, Philip? I nodded, too stunned to speak since spotting my stepbrother shopping. Brooks moved toward the boutique door but I put a hand on his arm to stop him. Please, don't. He frowned at me. Are you serious? Michelle, he's fleecing you and you're letting him. Let's go in there, tell them to refund the money onto his card, and make him pull money off the credit card to pay the landlord instead. I shook my head. Brooks, please, I don't want an argument in there. I hate confrontation, especially in public. Look, can we just go? Please? I'll deal with him in my own time in my own way. But. I said I don't want to do this, I exclaimed, turning and continuing down the sidewalk. I hurried with quick steps, wanting to get as far away from Philip and his latest shopping spree as possible. Although he was silent, Brooks kept pace beside me and we walked together without talking. I felt bad that I'd kind of snapped at him, but at the same time I didn't feel like it was fair of him to push for something I didn't want to do. Right when I was feeling like the entire date was ruined, I thought about saying something when all of a sudden his hand wrapped around mine. My belly fluttered and the contact with him instantly made me feel better. I turned to give him a small smile and the corners of his mouth lifted in return. Chapter 10 Despite the disastrous end to the date, and when was it ever anything but disastrous when Philip was involved, I was still on a high. Things couldn't have gone better if I'd written the date myself. My satisfaction included a teensy bit of smugness at having proved Brooks wrong, but mostly it was sheer delight at having written what had turned out to be a really good book the way it should have been written and not with realistic additions that were so not romantic. Feeling inspired, ideas percolated in my brain. I hadn't planned on writing a book too or an entire series, but the characters were talking in my head and who was I not to write out their story? The more I thought about it, the more it made sense. With my first manuscript printed out and laid around me on the kitchen counter, I settled down on the barstool to work on book two when there was a knock at the door. Who could that be? Brooks? My heart skipped a beat and I stood up too. It's your lucky day. Krista bustled in and strode toward me, with a grocery bag in one hand and a bottle of wine in the other. I'm cooking dinner for Missy and for you tonight. Did she call and tell you? No, I said, thinking she was being very sweet, but I didn't have time for socializing right now with my muse calling. As a writer, I had to type the ideas while they were freely coming. Oh, hey, that's really nice of you Krista, but… 
No buts, it's been ages since we had a girl's night in. She dropped her bag on the countertop, right on top of my manuscript for book one. She glanced at me and then down at the scattered papers. Were you working? I nodded. I have ideas for a book too and need to write the scenes while they are fresh in my mind. Not a problem. Krista moved her thumb and forefinger across her lips in a zipping motion and whispered, I'll be as quiet as a mouse, I promise. I grinned. It would be good to have dinner with the girls. We could catch up and I could tell them all about my date. But first, writing. If there was one thing I knew, it was to not disappoint my muse when she was raring to go. I settled back down on the barstool and retrieved my pages from under Krista's bag. Oh, Michelle. You'll never guess what my boss did, she said, as if she'd already forgotten her promise to be quiet. I'm sure I won't. I looked pointedly at Krista, but she was busy chopping garlic and didn't glance up to see me staring. She paused, knife poised in the air. My boss was peering into her hand mirror and kept asking us if we could see a wrinkle on her forehead. None of us could, because, you know, she paid a lot to have that taken care of since there used to be wrinkles and now nada. Krista, I really have to get this typed out if we're going to have dinner. Oh, right. No problem. She nodded and went back to chopping. I only had two sentences typed out in my first paragraph when Krista started laughing. Her gaze darted to me and she covered her mouth with her hand. Oops, sorry. I was just thinking about the mirror my boss pulled out that looked like a magnifying glass as she kept insisting there was a new wrinkle. There wasn't, but she wouldn't listen. You know? I can imagine. I mean, I know she's probably in her mid-fifties or so, but still. Aging is part of the deal. No need to obsess on it, right? I'm so not looking forward to menopause. I fixed my gaze on the sliver of garlic, which Krista had jettisoned onto my laptop screen, and watched it slowly slide down like a really pungent snail. Sorry, sorry, I'll shut up now. I wiped the screen and sat back down. Thanks. This won't take me that long, but I really have to get to it while the words are coming. There was silence for a couple of minutes, and I started to relax. How old do you think she is, though? Krista asked, chopping away at an onion. You've met my boss. She's not close to retirement age. You don't think she'll retire, do you? I'd really hate it if she did. She's easy to work for and you always hear stories about scary bosses and... Krista, hello? Typing. Poops, again. I'll zip it. We fell into an industrious piece, with me tapping away at my keyboard and Krista, actually, Krista was nowhere to be seen while her tomato basil sauce bubbled over, splashing out of the pan and onto my pages. Krista! A red-faced Krista slunk out of the bathroom, a small compact in her hand. What is it? Your sauce is bubbling over. What were you doing? She came around to my side of the countertop and jutted her chin out in my direction. Can you just check my forehead for me? I think I see a new wrinkle, but I'm not sure. I snatched the compact from her hand. You're twenty-seven. You don't have wrinkles, you're not menopausal, and your sauce is sticking. I moved my laptop from the countertop to the couch, just as my phone buzzed. I leaned back into the cushions, sighing because I really needed to get some work done. But what if my mom had been in a car accident? Or I'd won the lottery? Or something equally important? I checked my cell screen and saw a text from Brooks. My belly did a little flip as I opened the message, Hey, you okay? I sent a text back, Good, thanks. You? Twenty seconds later, my phone chirped, actually. 
I want to apologize for upsetting you about your stepbrother. It wasn't my place and I should have kept my mouth shut. I typed back, THX. I know you meant well. A few seconds later, can I make it up to you? My heart melted a little. I replied, what do you have in mind? He wrote, another date. This time, one from MY Story. Well, if I'd written one. I'd been so engrossed in texting Brooks that I hadn't even heard Missy coming in, but it was perfect timing. Guess what? I asked, hurrying over to her. Brooks just asked me if he could take me out on the kind of date he'd plan if this were his book and not mine. What do you think? My phone buzzed again, well? Missy grinned. I think he lures you. I rolled my eyes. Krista? Your opinion? She looked at Missy and they both winked. You obviously want to go, so yes. Do it. Michelle, the guy sounds smitten. Woo woo. That's exactly what I hoped you'd say. I clapped my hands together and then composed myself again to type, I'm in. Just tell me when and where. Brooks had told me to wear whatever was comfortable, and I had to admit I was intrigued. He'd arranged the date for the following evening, which was good. After only one night of not seeing him I was already missing him, not that I'd admit that to anyone. Welcome to Shea Keller. Brooks stepped back to let me in, and I walked into his condo. I inhaled appreciatively. Mmm, -hmm, something smells good. Brooks condo was gorgeous with a capital G warm and cozy, it had floor-to-ceiling bookshelves filled with books along one wall, throws draped across the couches, and an old rocking chair in front of the window. Brooks saw me looking at the rocking chair. It was my grandmother's. She used to sit in this chair and read stories to me when I was a kid. Now, whenever I want to escape for a while, I sit in her chair with a good book and lose myself for a few hours. I love it, especially when it rains, which isn't that often so it's special. Just like our visit to the bookstore, I said, watching him gesture toward the big window behind the rocking chair. I could just imagine how cozy it was sitting there, as the world fell silent to all but words in my mind and flames crackling in the fireplace. After taking my jacket, Brooks told me to make myself comfortable, and disappeared into the kitchen. The smell was making my tummy rumble, and after a few minutes he called me to the table. Ever the gentleman, he pulled out my chair and waited for me to sit before going back to the kitchen, returning with two big steaming bowls in his hands. I made alphabet soup for dinner. I looked at my bowl and laughed, slightly confused. Um. I can see that. He grinned. Don't judge a book by its cover. It's my signature dish and it's been cooking for a good long time. You'll love it. He wasn't kidding. The hot broth was delicious, beefy and robust, with tiny pieces of diced vegetables floating among the pasta letters. I broke off a piece of crusty bread and Brooks proudly informed me that it was homemade. It went perfectly with the soup. Someone might think you are trying to impress me, Mr. Keller. He looked intently at me. Maybe I am. I smiled. Do you specialize in alphabet soup, so you always have something to read, even when you're eating? He gave me a serious look. I used to help my grandpa make the soup when I was a kid. I nodded. I remember your grandpa. How is he? He stopped eating for a moment. He died a couple of years ago. Oh, no. Me and my big mouth. I'm so sorry, Brooks. I had no idea. He was a lovely man. What did he? I trailed off, not sure if asking how he had died was inappropriate or not. He had Alzheimer's, but died due to an infection. I reached across the table and squeezed his hand. 
I'm sorry, Brooks. I know how close you two were. He smiled, a faraway look on his face. When Grandpa went into a home, I would spend every Thursday with him there. On his good days, I'd get to take him out for a couple of hours. On his not-so-good days we would stay in, and we'd make alphabet soup together. It always helped him to remember who I was. I didn't know what to say. I felt desperately sad for Brooks, and sad also at the loss of such a lovely, kind-hearted man. You know, I was always a bit jealous of your family, I admitted. He looked at me, surprised. Really? Why? I mean, you had the perfect family. I looked at Brooks and took a sip of wine, shaking my head ever so slightly. He'd opened up to me about his grandfather, and I felt like I needed to open up a bit and reveal something of my own life, something he didn't know. Well, not quite perfect. He cocked his head to one side, but didn't say a word, waiting for me to go on in my own time. I tried to hide it, but life was actually difficult for me growing up. My parents had a tempestuous relationship, and there was a lot of arguing in my house. They only stayed together for me, apparently, something which I was frequently reminded of. It was Brooks' turn to hold my hand. I'm sorry, he said, echoing my own words. I had no idea. You always told me you had a really happy home life. I had actually envied you since my dad died when I was young and then my mom took off with another man, leaving me to be raised by my grandparents. I know that was hard for you. That's life, he said, giving a shrug. But your family always seemed so together. I shook my head. That's the image they wanted everyone to see, but it was all for show. Behind closed doors it was argument after argument with no end in sight. So, you escaped with your stories? I nodded. Yep, I wrote happy ever afters, because they were the only ones I could count on, the made-up ones. Although I did think you and I would, I gestured toward Brooks and then back at myself. I thought we would make our own fairy tale ending. His face fell. Oh, Michelle. I am so sorry, I just, he stopped, obviously not wanting to finish whatever it was he had started to say. He took the spoon out of my hand, began stirring my soup, and then he nodded at my bowl. I was lost in thought but followed his gaze. Floating on the top of my soup were three little words. Please be wine? I asked. He looked down at the floating letters and laughed. The M must have turned upside down. It was meant to be romantic. I took the spoon and maneuvered a few letters of my own. Ox? he asked. I frowned, and laughed too. Okay. It was supposed to say okay dot. He took my hand. I know. I'm only teasing. I smiled, looking into his beautiful eyes and the years fell away. As he leaned toward me, I closed my eyes and the familiar feeling of his lips on mine made my heart flutter. The kiss lasted for what seemed like forever, and yet was over too soon. When he finally pulled back his eyes seemed to have changed color, so deep and full. Without saying a word he moved his chair around to my side of the table and kissed me again, his right hand caressing my cheek. I've missed you, Michelle. His lips brushed mine as he spoke. I've missed you so much. Suddenly I wanted to know, needed to know how he could have let us go. Then why, Brooks? Why did you end what we had between us? He stroked the hair back from my face and tucked it behind my ear. I was stupid, and young, and... I didn't let him finish his sentence. Just like that night at the masquerade ball, I leaned in and pressed my mouth to his, only the kisses lasted a lot longer this time. Chapter 11 Yesterday evening with Brooks had been intense. 
not only because of the discoveries we'd learned about each other, but also because we had kissed long into the night, the alphabet soup cold and forgotten and the home-baked bread going stale and dry. Now, here we were on a lunch date at an Italian restaurant called Café Mattia. Thanks for meeting me, he said. I smiled at him. Of course. He smiled at me. I was a little worried. I felt like maybe I'd open some old wounds for you last night. I shook my head. No, it's fine. I stopped talking to take a bite of pizza, a slice so delicious that for a moment I couldn't talk. Wow, that's almost as good as your soup. He laughed. Thanks for the praise. Didn't I tell you this was the best pizza in the entire city? I stopped suddenly and narrowed my eyes at Brooks, holding the enormous pepperoni triangle in midair. Wait a minute, that's a line from my book. Wait, this entire scene is a chapter from my book. Brooks feigned innocence for a moment, and then broke into a boyish grin. Glad you caught that since you're the author and all. I thought we should get back on track with our experiment. Brooks Keller, if I didn't have my hands full of Café Mattia's finest, I'd throw my arms around you right here, right now. I was touched. I had no idea that Brooks could be so romantic. Yet here we were, living out another one of my chapters. Well, after last night I wanted to give you a romantic date of your own. And I have to admit, Brooks broke off for a moment, as if deciding whether or not to continue. You really do have some pretty cool date ideas. My cheeks heated at the compliment. Why thank you, kind sir. He kissed the back of my hand. My pleasure, ma'am. I reached out and wiped a smidgen of sauce from the corner of Brooks' delectable mouth, and he turned his face to my hand, kissing the palm gently. After we finished lunch, he paid the bill and we walked down the sidewalk hand in hand. I have to tell you something, Michelle, he said. My heart dropped to my stomach. I have to tell you something can rarely be anything good. He took my elbow and guided me to a wooden bench just inside the gates of a park. I sat down and looked at him. You're married? I asked. He frowned. What? No. Engaged? Seriously, Michelle? No. I thought for a moment. You're not sick, are you? He took my face in his hands. Stop, okay? It's nothing like that. So, what? I asked. He took a deep breath. You asked me last night why I broke up with you. That's all right. You don't have to say, I said, looking down at the ground. I always figured it was because I wasn't intellectual enough for you. Me, with my romance novels, always escaping into worlds filled with happy ever afters instead of reality as you call it. He looked horrified. No, that's not why. Quite the opposite, in fact. I lifted my lashes. Then why? He blew out a breath. I loved being with you. I loved every minute of every day that we spent together. I shook my head. So, what then? His opened his eyes wide. Well, you were smart, so smart that you won that scholarship. I couldn't stand in your way, Michelle. My eyebrows came together. I don't understand. Your family couldn't afford to pay your way into another college, so that scholarship was everything to your future. It was your ticket to go on to bigger, better things. I couldn't let you throw that away for me. Just like you said that night at Krista's apartment. My eyes filled with tears and I shook my head. You weren't making that up. No, he said, quietly. But, I wanted to be with you. I know, but I couldn't let you miss that opportunity for me, he said, wiping my tears with his thumb. 
I wanted to be with you, too. I let you go for you, Michelle. It broke my heart. I couldn't believe my ears. So, you didn't end things because I read romance novels and not the kind of books you read? He shook his head, half smiling. I love the fact that you were so romantic and so optimistic about life. It was the reason I let you go, so you could put that imagination and enthusiasm to good use and not waste it following me. He cupped my chin and lifted my face so he could look into my eyes. But believe me when I say, I never ever got over losing you. And then he kissed me and I never wanted it to end. Standing outside the Jeffreys Hotel that Friday night, I couldn't hide my excitement for our date tonight. Brooks was standing behind me with his hands over my eyes, and he guided me through the doors, propelling me forward. Don't let me walk into anything, I said, my hands groping the air in front of me. He chuckled. I won't. My foot caught something and I stumbled. Brooks. You promised. You tripped over the heel of your own shoe. Trust me, okay? There had been a time when the very idea of trusting Brooks Keller would have made me recoil in horror, but now it was a different story. Okay, I trust you, I said. We stopped, and Brooks let go of my eyes, making me promise to keep them closed as he moved away for a moment. There was a gentle rush of air as he opened what sounded like heavy doors, and then he was back behind me, nudging me forward again. Okay, now when I say step, I need you to step up slightly and forward at the same time. I nodded, but moved before he was ready and felt myself lurch forward, the way you do when you miscalculate how many stairs there are and think there's one more to go when there isn't. My foot landed with the grace of a sumo wrestler. Brooks! I exclaimed. He stifled his laughter. I told you to wait until I said step. Okay, ready? I nodded, shuffling my toes forward until they made contact with something, and then moving them up until I felt the top of whatever it was Brooks wanted me to stand on. Okay, now shuffle to your right. A little bit more. No, too far. A couple of inches left. Okay, perfect. Now sit. I did as I was told, sitting down all the way on the ground, with something soft and velvety beneath me. I felt Brooks take a seat behind me. Now, open your eyes, he said. I cautiously opened first one and then the other eye. Then both of my eyes widened in disbelief as I looked around the room. We were sitting on a plush, purple carpet with gold tassels, on the floor of a banquet room. The room was vast and round, with smooth white walls. What is going on? I asked, noticing a projector set up in the middle of the floor behind us. I looked back at Brooks, who sat behind me, and he smiled. As if on cue, the first strains of music from Aladdin's A Whole New World began to play. I leaned back against Brooks' chest and a fan started, blowing wind in my face. It felt as if we were flying through the air like Aladdin and Jasmine in the movie. Look, Brooks said, pointing toward a wall, where the projector had displayed panoramic images of the Taj Mahal. So, amazing! I exclaimed. Hold on tight, he murmured, and the rug beneath us began to move. How did you do this? Magic, I rubbed a lamp, he said, slipping his arms around my waist as we slowly glided around the circular room, the images constantly changing just ahead of us, showing all the places in the world I have always wanted to see. Oh, it's Paris. Look, it's the Eiffel Tower, I said. He chuckled. We. Oui. I sighed with delight as I leaned back against him, watching the four corners of the world appearing on the walls as we floated past on, well, on a magic carpet. As the music faded, silvery fairy lights appeared on the ceiling and the carpet came to a stop. How did you do this? I mean, really, how? I asked, shaking my head. 
He had recreated another romantic scene from my book and had managed to make it even more magical. He laughed as he held me. The wonders of electric skateboards, he said as he lifted the corner of the carpet and showed me the skateboard underneath. And a remote control turntable thingy to set the projector on so it could move around the room. I had an old friend put it together for me. I was lost for words for a moment and genuinely choked up with emotion as I turned to face him. I took his face in my hands and kissed him in a very end of the movie Princess Y way. Things didn't get much more perfect than this. Thank you, I said, opening my mouth as his kiss went deeper. Once he pulled back, I smiled. You are amazing, really. You win, he whispered into my ear as he held me again. I pulled back and searched his eyes. I do? Yes, Michelle. He nodded, those blue eye filled with emotion. I've fallen for you all over again, Michelle. This means you were right. Modern fairy tales really do come true. I pressed my mouth to his again. That makes you Prince Charming, after all. Mmm, he said, kissing me again. A deal is a deal, though. Come to the office tomorrow and we'll go over the contract. The manuscript will be published by Prince and Company, your way. You'll publish my book, just as it is? I asked, watching him nod. Oh, good. He raised his eyebrows. That's all you have to say? I giggled, leaning forward. Don't worry. I've fallen for you, too. The corners of his mouth rose, before he pressed his mouth to mine. Brooks dropped me off at home and I walked into the condo feeling tipsy from his dreamy kisses. When I pulled myself from my purse, I checked the screen and saw that I had a voicemail. I listened to the message in a daze. Hi, I'm calling for Mia Mapleton. This is Jody McLaughlin from Paradise Bound Publishing. I received your manuscript that you submitted to us and I have to tell you I love love loved it. You captured the romance and the happily ever after in a way I've never read before. Very original. Please call me back at this number as soon as you're able. Don't worry about the time. We would love the opportunity to publish your wonderful book just as it is. It's absolutely perfect. I listened with my mouth hanging open as Jody gushed about the various parts of my book that made her swoon. I called her back and my eyes widened at the offered advance, which was far bigger than the $10,000 advance Brooks had offered. But I was supposed to be at Brooks' office tomorrow to sign the contract. Now, I was torn. Chapter 12 Are you ready for some serious retail therapy? Krista asked wearing an animated expression. She loved shopping, especially when it involved trying on glamorous gowns and sparkly shoes. Seriously, Michelle? Isn't this fun? I shrugged. Meh. She turned to me as we were about to push open the door to a boutique dress shop downtown. What do you mean, meh? We are trying on gorgeous dresses and all you can say is meh? What's going on with you? I reached past her to push the door open, and then sighed. It's a book thing. Her eyebrows came together as we breezed inside, and she set her purse down on one of the luxurious chairs in the middle of the floor. I sat down in the other chair and crossed my legs. This chair is nicer than anything I have in my apartment. Think I can smuggle it out in my tote? I joked, as I stroked the plush blue velvet. The chair reminded me of Brooke's incredible magic carpet ride, and butterflies returned to my stomach. I was so torn between wanting to take the offer from Jody and being loyal to Brooks. After all, he just made editor, so I would be the first author he signed. No, I don't think you could smuggle out an entire chair, she said, holding up a gown she'd found but you might be able to get it under the skirt. Would you look at the layers on this? It's pretty, 
I said, without much interest. The dress was ice blue with long lacy sleeves, a fitted bodice, and the frothiest skirt I had ever seen. You should totally try it on, she said. I wrapped my fingers against the arm of the chair. Why don't you try it on? You found it. She put her head to one side and raised her eyebrow. Because you are into this fairy tale style dress, and it would look magical on you. I'm more into a slinky, can't breathe in this but it looks good so I'll wear it anyway kind of gown. You know, your logic actually makes sense, I said, getting up to open the curtains of a changing room and going inside with the dress. You'll never guess what my boss has done now, Krista said. What's she done this time? I asked, stepping into the dress and pulling it up before sliding my arms into the sleeves. She asked me to go out for donuts yesterday when the woman is so anti-sugar. I mean, not even in her salad dressing. So, I asked her if she was sure she wanted to eat a donut and she said yes, and asked me to buy a dozen and bring them back for the staff, which was weird because there were only three of us in today, get me? Uh-huh. How's it going with the dress? I'm pretty sure the sleeves are giving me a rash. Can you grab me another one to try? Krista passed a red number into me, but the fabric felt too stiff. So, I got the donuts, and then an hour later she came out all red-faced from her office and asked me to go and get some donuts. She asked you again? I heard Krista's earring jingling as she nodded. Yep. Weird, right? So, I said to her you do know I've brought you a box already? and she looked all confused, rubbed the sugar from her chin, and burst into tears. I poked my head out through the curtains, and handed Krista the dress. Hate it. What about that blue one? So, what happened next? Did she send you for cookies? Good one, but no. Krista swapped dresses over for me, and then disappeared into the next cubicle to try on a black satin sheath dress she'd found. She said I was making things up to confuse her, and then she shut herself in her office all day. All I know is, by the end of the day that donut box was empty and I only had one. There was silence for a few moments. Everything all right? I asked. Tata, she exclaimed. Krista had somehow managed to pour herself into a sheath dress and looked stunning as she turned this way and that in front of the mirror outside of our dressing rooms. How is it so easy for you to get the right dress? I'm getting all hot and sweaty trying these dresses on and they look terrible on me. I still haven't found the one I want. Try on this one, she said, handing me a new dress. I took the gown into the dressing room and put it on with zero hope of it looking good. I mean, I could only take so much disappointment. Can you zip me up? I asked. I stepped out of the room and Krista's mouth dropped open. Oh, my, you look just like Cinderella, she said. Really? I looked in the mirror and had to admit, it did look magical. The blue dress sat just off my shoulders, the fitted bodice giving way to a beautiful full skirt, which fell to the floor in soft folds. All I needed was a pair of long white gloves. You've found your dress, Krista said. I think you're right, I said, turning to look at the fit from all angles. Your boss sounds like she's having a rough time. Why don't you talk to her? Maybe she's having some kind of breakdown or something. Communication is key, after all. Krista looked thoughtful. Yeah, maybe you're right. Anyway, Brooks will flip when he sees you in that dress. A modern-day, real-life city girl princess, just like in your book. My book, I dropped into the chair and rubbed my temples. Oh, no. Did you lose the bet? No, I won, I said, and told her about my dilemma with Jody versus Brooks. I'm so tempted by the other offer. I mean, the advance is almost double what Brooks is offering. More importantly, she genuinely loves my book. 
Brooks, on the other hand, really wanted me to change my ending and it took a lot to get him to change his mind. I basically had to make him fall in love with me, which he hadn't thought was possible. So, you get two for the price of one. Not a bad deal. Except that Jody loves my book, just as it is. Her offer is better financially, too. But my loyalty is with Brooks. Which is where it should be. Right? Sounds complicated. She turned around so I could undo her dress, and as she disappeared back inside her dressing room she echoed my words back to me. Why don't you talk to Brooks? Didn't someone once say that communication is key, after all? I rolled my eyes and then laughed. Always good to have my own advice thrown back at me, forcing me to have a conversation that was sure to be awkward at best. After leaving Krista, I wandered up to Brooks' building, stopping to grab a coffee from Courtney on the way. It was lunchtime, so there was no chance to talk but I blew her a kiss and took my coffee to go. I was a little early for my appointment, so I loitered outside Prince and Company Publishing, drinking my coffee and wishing I had brought some gum or a packet of mints to take away the coffee breath. I smiled at myself being presumptuous and had to remind myself that I was there on business, not as Brooke's girlfriend. Of course, that thought made me smile even more. It had been a long time since I'd called myself anyone's girlfriend, and while Brooks and I hadn't done the whole we're together talk, he had admitted that he'd fallen for me. As I traveled up the elevator to Brooks' floor, I thought again about the phone message I had received from Jody. I hadn't called her back with an answer yet, because I wanted to wait until the contract with Brooks was signed, sealed, and delivered before I did. While I knew I would definitely go with Brooks' offer, I couldn't help but feel a little bothered about the difference in advance amounts. With the money Brooks would give me, I'd be able to pay off Philip's rent problems, but with the offer Jody had made, I'd be able to do that, replenish my savings, and treat myself to that pair of sparkly heels I'd been wanting. The elevator slid to a smooth stop with a ping, and I couldn't help but remember getting stuck in here with Brooks, which seemed like ages ago. A pang of annoyance flitted into my thoughts as I recalled him scrutinizing my book. Okay, maybe that word was a bit strong, but I'd never forget his three us, unrealistic, unimaginable, and unpublishable. The doors opened, and I smoothed down my skirt as I walked into the lobby, my heels clicking as I went. Even though this was only a formality, I wanted to dress appropriately as I would if I were meeting, say, Jody. I shook my head to clear thoughts of the other offer from my head. I had committed to signing with Brooks, and my loyalty was definitely with him. This time, there was a receptionist behind the desk, who looked up as I approached. Can I help you? she asked. I nodded. Yes, I'm here to see Brooks Keller. Are you Michelle Moss? That's me. A huge smile spread across her face. I, um, loved your book. I blinked, surprised. You read it? Three times, she said, looking a bit embarrassed. It's the best book I've read all year. Would you please sign it for me once it's published? Of course I will. I'm so glad to hear you enjoyed the story, I said, resisting the urge to jump up and down and squeal with joy. Brooks entered the lobby from the hall. Michelle, you're here. Come on in. Julia, could you hold my calls and arrange for some coffee, please? Of course, Mr. Keller, she said, as I realized she was the second person to love my book, without saying it needed changes. I walked with Brooks down the hall and into his office. He gestured to the seat in front of his desk where I'd sat before, while he sat on the other side. Okay, so, he pulled a stack of papers from a file on his desk, and put his glasses on as he scanned the cover page. This is a copy of the contract between Prince and Company and you. Read through it carefully. Let me know if you'd like your lawyer to look it over. If you're happy with everything then you can sign here, and here. 
I watched him slide the contract across the desk and click the pen open before handing it to me. I took the pen, shaking my head. Who would have thought that I, of all people, would be the very first author on your list? Isn't it weird? I mean, of all the novels you could have chosen, you chose mine. It's fate, I'm telling you. He leaned back in his chair, lacing his hands behind his head. A deal's a deal. You know I've always been a man of my word, Michelle. I said I'd publish it the way it is if you won, and you did. Congratulations. I frowned at his words as I glanced through the pages and finally set the pen down on his desk. Brooks, you do believe in the book, right? He nodded. Of course. The writing is superb. There was a knock on the door, and Julia entered, carrying a tray with coffee and biscuits. She set it down on the desk. I bit my bottom lip. And you accept that the book is realistic now? He hesitated. Well, not exactly. I still think it's far-fetched, but in a cute way, and readers love that kind of thing, so it's all good. I'm only one opinion, Julia loved it. Yes, she told me, I said, wishing his enthusiasm matched hers. Readers love that kind of thing, so it's all good. That kind of thing? Whimsical romance, even if it's unrealistic. I couldn't believe my ears. How can you still say it's unrealistic, Brooks? It worked for us. He reached across the desk and took my hand. A date in a broom closet would have worked for us, Michelle. We are meant to be. That's sweet, I said, because I felt the same way. But my brain immediately went back to my book and the fact that my would-be editor didn't believe in it 100%. My head kept telling me to just accept what he was saying and that it didn't make a difference but my heart was slightly disappointed that he still felt that my book wouldn't resonate as real the way I wrote it. I picked up the pen and signed my name. You know, I said, letting out a long breath as he reached for the signed contract. I turned down a very lucrative offer for you. Paradise Bound was very excited to acquire my book and they loved it just the way it is. He pulled his hand away, leaving the papers on the desk, as he stared at me. What's wrong? I asked. You didn't tell me another publisher was interested in your book. I waved a hand dismissively. I sent out a few queries the night of the masquerade ball. That's why I brought my laptop with me that night. You didn't tell me that, he said, looking upset. Why does it matter? Are you able to match their advance? Their offer is almost double, so I felt bad asking you. I don't have any more authorization than the advance I offered, he said, his face going white as he cleared his throat. Look, Michelle, I'll honor our agreement and publish your book, but I think you should take the other deal. Why? I asked. It's more money, he pointed out. But I'd rather work with you, I said, even though I did like the fact that Jody thought my book was perfect the way I wrote it. And I gave you my word. You always do this, his voice trailed off and his gaze couldn't quite meet my eyes. I reached out to take his hand, but he pulled it out of reach and let it drop into his lap. I frowned. Do what? Make bad decisions because of me. He cleared his throat again, and his entire demeanor had changed. He looked cold and distant, as if I were sitting across from a stranger now. Look, I don't think it's a good idea to mix business with pleasure. I'll publish your book, but I don't think we should see each other anymore, except on a professional basis. I. I don't understand, I said, shaking my head, which had gone pretty dizzy. Why on earth shouldn't we date? You're choosing the worst deal for your book and you'll blame me later when you regret it, he said, firmly. No, I'm making the decision that feels right to me. 
I racked my brain trying to understand why he had pulled away. It felt like there was a gulf between us now, but the reason certainly couldn't be about something as shallow as money. I don't know what's really going on, but don't push me away. His expression flickered for a moment and he seemed to waver. But then his brow wrinkled. You're making a mistake and I won't let you do that. So, that's it? I have no say? I asked, watching him stand, as if to signal this meeting was over. Now that we're through, you have no reason to feel obligated to Prince and Company. You should take the offer from the other publisher. It sounds like it will be much better for your career, Michelle. Are we really back here again? I asked, as tears sprang into my eyes. No, Brooks, I won't accept their offer. I want you to publish my book. You. My boyfriend. You've been on this journey with me from the start and it's only right that we. Boyfriend? I just said we're done, he said, holding up his palms. Real life isn't like your fairy tale book, okay? It sucks and it's unfair and it's cruel, but that's just the way it is. But, everything you said on our dates. He looked away. Those dates were all part of the bet, Michelle. You knew that. Look, it's all over, you, me, and the contract. Go to Paradise Bound and get your better deal, and you'll soon forget about Prince and Company. And you? I asked, my heart clenching. And me, he said, his tone firm. With that, he held the door open. My hands shook and I couldn't believe he was doing this to me again. After I left his office, I wasn't sure if the sound I heard was the door clicking shut or the sound of my heart breaking for the second time, but it hurt, it hurt so much. Chapter 13 The sound of a whistle being blown greeted me as I opened my front door and walked inside. Krista and Missy were watching women's soccer on TV. As usual, Krista was extolling the virtues of the game to Missy in an attempt to get her to sign up for the local team. She'd tried recruiting me many times to no avail. It's way more social than going to the gym, Missy. It's so much fun. I rarely go to the gym. I just go running in the mornings with Michelle. Hey, speak of the devil, Missy laughed and moved over on the couch so I could sit down next to her. Come on, you're not going to tell me that running from A to B is more fun than the adrenaline rush from the ball hitting the back of the net? Seriously? Michelle, what do you think? Running is boring compared to playing soccer, right? Krista asked, the corners of her mouth turning downward as she looked at me and then exchanged a glance with Missy. Oh, no. Missy put her arm around my shoulder. What's going on? You look awful. I shrugged, fighting to hold back the tears, while I told them that Brooks dumped me. Is it wine o'clock yet? Krista asked, standing up. I think we could do with a glass. What do you think? Or muffins, what about muffins? Krista always turned to food and wine when the going got tough. Not a bad idea. I wouldn't exactly turn down a chocolate chip muffin right now. Guy troubles. I should have known, Missy said, pulling me closer to her. They are the root of all our problems. So many can't be trusted. Honestly, sometimes I think women should just adopt a dog like Abigail did. Her pup, Banana, is loyal, faithful, and she doesn't even have to worry about him leaving the toilet seat up. No, but you do have to clean up their mess. Although, I suppose that's the same with men, I muttered, a dark cloud overtaking me. Krista returned with a plate of cookies and offered them to me. Oh, come on. It's not all men. Take Abigail, for instance. Her boyfriend, Cooper, is the sweetest guy ever. 
he dotes on her, is supportive, and she hasn't had a speeding ticket since she met him since he's a cop. All good things. Brooks is an editor, who hates my book. He never said he hates it, Krista pointed out. Give it time, sweetie. That's what I did to get over my cheating ex-fiancé. And I'm happy now, Missy said, her teeth snapping into a cookie in a very scary way. I smiled weakly. Is that supposed to make me feel better? Don't be so cynical, Missy. Michelle needs cheering up, not being told it's a lost cause. Hey, all I'm saying is look at my fiancé. He had all this, she gestured toward herself with a grin. And he still cheated. Brooks didn't cheat, Krista pointed out. I wiped a tear away. I just thought Brooks was the one, you know? I told the girls I needed some time alone and plopped down on my bed, wrapping myself up in my comforter. If I couldn't get my fairy tale ending in real life, then I'd just read about it in my manuscript instead. There was no way I could work on book two right now, though. I felt too sad about losing Brooks again. Anything I wrote right now would most likely come out like a Shakespearean tragedy. My phone rang and I jumped, my heart racing. It had to be Brooks calling to tell me he'd made a terrible mistake. I grabbed the phone without checking the name and put it to my ear. Hello? Michelle? And the heart racing came to an abrupt halt. Hi, Philip. Hey, how are you doing? He sounded way too chirpy for a man who was about to get evicted, which could only mean one thing, he was after something. What's up? I asked. There was silence on the other end of the phone. I knew it! Philip, if you're calling about the money, I told you I'd have it on time and I will, but you're going to have to wait. I don't have it yet, I said, knowing I so wasn't in the mood for this. There was another long stretch of silence before he said, Ah, the money. Well, the thing is. My spirits lifted a tiny bit. Maybe Philip had found a way to be responsible for once and had managed to get the money for his rent together himself. The thing is. I prodded. He cleared his throat, a sure sign he was stalling. Well, the thing is, I need a tiny bit more. My eyebrows came together. How much more? Not much. Nothing unreasonable. Philip, giving you any money is unreasonable. You're a grown man, I pointed out. He sighed audibly. You know you're my favorite sister, don't you? You're the only person in the world I can actually count on. I pulled the phone away from my ear and glared at it. Was he for real? I'm your only sister, Philip, and if you don't tell me how much you need I'll be your MIA sister. I'm not in the mood for games. Well, the thing is. I need another grand. Another thousand dollars? Are you insane? Philip, I'm going to go now before I say something I'll regret. I have my own problems to deal with and quite frankly, I have no headspace left for yours. I could almost see his mouth drop open as I hung up the phone. I read long into the night and woke up with a page of my manuscript sticking to my cheek. Missy had left me a sweet note on the table telling me to call her if I needed to talk, that Brooks was obviously an idiot and that I was better off without him. I smiled, appreciating Missy's support even though Brooks was one of the smartest people I knew, which is one of the reasons his feedback on my novel stung so much. I headed to the bathroom for a shower. Rather than sit in the apartment and mope alone, I decided to take a walk to clear my head and found myself following the delicious scent of freshly ground coffee. Hey, Michelle, how's it going? Courtney asked. Could be better, I said, which was an understatement. Not only had I lost the love of my life, had been rejected by Prince and company, again, but Philip called and our conversation went exactly the same way as always. 
It felt like the worst kind of Groundhog Day. May I have my usual, please? She glanced at me over the top of her coffee machine. What happened now? I'm okay, thanks, I lied, because I didn't want to ruin her morning. How are you doing today? A gold sequin sun sat on the front of her bright blue t-shirt. I'm fabulous. It's a beautiful day, the sun is shining, and life is good. I shook my head. If you say so. She added foam to my coffee, before putting on the lid and setting it down in front of me. She waved her hand as I attempted to pay. It's on the house. You look like you could use it. I smiled, which took every ounce of effort. Thanks, Courtney. Whoop whoop, that's better. Courtney hated seeing anyone being down, especially her friends. Enough of the polite talk. What's on your mind, Michelle? I sighed. Where do I start? She leaned forward, resting her elbows on the small countertop. Well, why not start at your most recent problem and work backwards? I took a sip of hot coffee and closed my eyes for a moment. Okay, most recent problem is Philip. She rolled her eyes, but didn't say a word. I told you I have to find nine grand to pay his back rent, right? Well, he called me last night and said he needed another thousand. I don't know what to do. Why is this your problem? Courtney wrapped up a brownie in a napkin and handed it to me. She was another feeder. Life is short, way too short to be bailing out a grown man who wouldn't know responsibility if it hit him between the eyes. But the real problem is. I blinked and checked behind me since she continued to stare. The real problem? What do you mean? She wriggled her index finger around in the air before pointing it firmly in my direction. The problem is you, my dear. Sorry, I mean that in the kindest possible way. My eyebrows rose. What have I done, except bail him out time after time? You love him, I get that. But you're enabling him to overspend. Stop helping him out. Stop paying his debts. And stop letting him walk all over you. When the bank runs dry, he'll have to stop overspending, especially since good old sis isn't there to pick up the pieces. Stop helping him out? I asked, considering what would be the result of that as I took a tiny bite of brownie, and then a second bite immediately following. Courtney's pastries were from Bernie's Bakery in East Sacramento and majorly delicious. I co-signed the lease on his apartment. I'm liable for the rent if he doesn't pay it. She leaned toward me. Yes, but just the threat of you not paying might spur him into action. Tell him you're going to seek legal advice about getting your name taken off the agreement, or that you're going to move overseas, anything to make him sit up and take notice. Maybe I could move overseas, I said, pondering where I'd go. I could hide in the Maldives for a while. I hear it's nice there. You need to confront him, Michelle. Tell him exactly what's on your mind. No filtering. I chewed on my bottom lip. She had a point about Philip taking over his own problems. It would be an enormous weight off my shoulders to not have that additional responsibility hanging over my head. I nodded. You're right, as always. She narrowed her gaze, and scrutinized me. That's not all that's bothering you, though, is it? I shook my head. There's also the book thing, and... You don't have to say it. Courtney picked up a cloth and started wiping down her already pristine coffee machine. I saw Brooks this morning. I cringed. Oh. Yeah, I've never seen him so upset. What's going on? I told Courtney about how he had agreed to publish my book, but then pulled the rug from under me by saying that I should take the other offer. I just don't get it, Courtney. 
What happened? She stopped wiping. Life is short, Michelle. Way too short to be walking around with a sad face. Talk to Brooks, confront him, and tell him exactly what's on your mind. I already tried that and he pushed me away. I gave a mirthless chuckle. Confronting him a second time is going to be a lot easier said than done. Don't think, just do it. I'll give it some thought, I said, stepping aside as another customer approached her cart. Chapter 14 After walking around window shopping, aka, hoping to bump into Brooks, I decided to take Courtney's advice and headed over to Philip's place. Thankfully, the apartment was a lot quieter than the last time I had been there. In fact, I wondered if Philip was even home, but after buzzing for the third time a voice came over the intercom. Hello? A voice squeaked. I stepped back and looked at the button I had pressed, thinking I must have pressed the wrong one. I jabbed it again, the same one as before. Hello? The squeaky voice said again. I leaned in toward the speaker. Philip? Oh, Michelle. Thank goodness it's you, he said, his voice changing to a more normal tone. The door opened and I went in. Sis, so good to see you. I wish I could say the same thing, I said, as he pulled me inside, checked left and right outside, and then closed the door. I put my hands on my hips. Did you just answer the buzzer in a woman's voice? He had the good grace to look embarrassed. Um, kinda. My eyes widened. What on earth for? He grimaced. Well, a few people are chasing me for money I owe them. I pretend to be a little old lady to make them go away and it's worked twice. He grinned and shrugged. It's a good voice, though, right? I totally had you fooled. This is beyond ridiculous. I crossed my arms. Philip, we need to talk. His face fell, and he dropped down on the couch with a sigh. Oh, sounds serious. I remained standing. It is serious, Philip. You have no idea how much trouble you're in, and you're dragging me down with you. This isn't the Titanic, Philip. I'm not a musician in the band. I'm getting out now, while I still can. I hadn't intended to blurt my thoughts out, but I couldn't help it. Philip sat with his head in his hands, and I sank down next to him. Look, Philip, you're my brother. Stepbrother, he said miserably. I put my hand around his shoulder. You're my brother and I will always be here for you, but I can't help you financially anymore. You need to start standing on your own two feet. It's not fair that I use my book advance to pay for your rent, while you squander even more money away in stores I can't afford to shop in. He looked up sharply. Ah, uh, what? I nodded. I saw you at Taylor and Sons the other day. You were buying up half the store. Philip looked mortified. Why didn't you say something? I was on a date, Philip. My life can't keep getting sidetracked by you and your irresponsible ways. This has to stop, once and for all. You've never talked to me like this before, he said, his bottom lip quivering. Shockingly, he started crying, pressing his palms to his face. I can't help myself, Michelle. I'm not talented like you. I need something to make myself feel better. Shopping makes you feel better? I asked. Yes, in a way. I feel more successful with nice things. Philip, you don't have a job. How can you expect to feel successful? Exactly, he said, sniffling and wiping his cheeks. There's so much missing from my life, and I don't know how to fix it. I'm not strong like you. You can become strong, one good decision at a time. What does that even mean? He asked, 
looking up at me. You're creative and you have everything going for you. You're even dating. I'm on my own and I want to change things. I need to change things, but I don't know how. You won't leave me, too, will you? My eyes watered. I'll never leave you, Philip. I'll always be here. He collapsed in my arms, his forehead on my shoulder as he sobbed. Everyone leaves. That's not true. I'm here. Mom's here. She cut me off. Only financially. You're a grown man, perfectly capable of getting a job and earning a living. She can't support you in that way forever. He lifted his head. Will you help me? Of course I'll help you, bro, I said, looking him in the eyes. It was the first time Philip had ever shown that vulnerable side of himself to me. Although it hurt to see him sad, it was also a big breakthrough. I kept my arm around his shoulders and pulled him closer. But you have got to stick to the plan, okay? I'll try. He wiped his nose on his sleeve, so gross, and nodded. His expression reminded me of when he was twelve years old and my heart melted. No, it's like Mr. Miyagi said in The Karate Kid. You either do, or you don't, or you'll get squashed like a blueberry. He rolled his eyes. Like a grape. Whatever, I said, the corners of my mouth twitching. It was your favorite movie, not mine. So, what do you say? We'll make a plan and you'll stick to it. Yes? He crossed his heart with his index finger. I will, I promise. So what is the plan? I thought for a moment. First, we look for a job for you. Do you have a tablet around here where we can get online? He nodded, and pulled up a search engine. I took the tablet from him and opened up a local employment page, scanning the ads. Okay, phase one. We go through the jobs listings, find one you're qualified for, and apply. You don't have to love it, but you have to do it until you find something else. Agreed? He smiled at me for the first time. Agreed. See? You've made your first good decision. You're on your way. Michelle? Yes, Philip? I love you. My heart warmed. I love you, too. After I left my brother, I decided to walk downtown. Talking to Philip about the day I'd seen him in the boutique had brought back bittersweet memories of the hours Brooks and I had spent in the bookstore. The memories were bitter because Brooks was no longer in my life, and sweet because it had been one of the most perfect dates of my life. I wanted to talk to him, but I wasn't sure what to say. And I was drained from the showdown with Philip, even though that had turned out to be a positive experience for once. So, I sought solace the best way I knew how in books. As I walked into Hilda's hideaway bookstore, the owner smiled in greeting as the bell tinkled above the door. She checked behind me as if expecting to see someone else there. Hello, again, she said cheerily. Good afternoon, Hilda. I smiled, my heart heavy as I made my way to the back of the shop where Brooks and I had sat and read together. I ran my finger absent-mindedly along the spines of the books, but of course, Little Women wasn't there, because Brooks had bought it for me. I pulled out Little Men, the sequel to my favorite book. The heater was off, but I sat down in the same chair as before, and although I tried to read, my mind just wouldn't stay on the words. I kept going back to that day in Brooke's office. A deal's a deal. You know I've always been a man of my word, Michelle. I said I'd publish it the way it is if you won, and you did. Congratulations. I'd known as he said those words that things were going to go downhill fast. The whole idea of the challenge had been to open his mind about the book, not for him to grudgingly agree to publish it without any changes because I'd won some stupid bet. I still think it's far-fetched, 
but in a cute way, and readers love that kind of thing, so it's all good. I could feel my face flaming as I recalled his smile. How could he say my idea of romance was far-fetched when we'd literally lived the pages and fallen in love? Or so I'd thought. If Brooks had really fallen in love with me, he'd have been right behind me, cheering me on like a partner, not criticizing me like an editor. A date in a broom closet would have worked for us, Michelle. We are meant to be. Clearly not, I muttered as I slammed the book shut, giving up on reading. After all, if Brooks and I were meant to be then we'd be together right now. I couldn't get my head around the way he changed in a split second. Hey, if you don't want the book, just put it back on the shelf. You don't have to slam it around, came a familiar male voice. I jumped and turned around. Brooks. What are you doing here? His presence seemed to fill the entire room. You see me in a bookstore and you're surprised? I shrugged. Good point. But, this is our bookstore. He raised one eyebrow. Our bookstore? My face heated. I mean, there are bookstores closer to your place, that's all. He perched on the arm of one of the chairs and smiled, pushing his glasses up his nose and raking his hand through his hair. But I like this one. I nodded. So how's? I saw Courtney. We both spoken at the same time, which made me start to laugh. Then I remembered there was nothing to smile about right now. I'm sorry, you go first, he said. I smiled, despite myself. I was just going to ask how work is going. He nodded. Fine, good. I saw Courtney this morning. Me, too. Had a delicious brownie from her, I said, and then threw my gaze at the ceiling. This is lame. We're talking like two strangers, not people who've known each other for years. He moved from the arm to the seat and sat down. Just so you know, you'll never be a stranger to me, Michelle. I took a deep breath. Brooks, I've decided to take Jody up on her offer. I've got a meeting with her to go over the contract, but the bottom line is she's willing to publish the book exactly how it is. Brooks smiled the biggest smile I'd ever seen. That's fantastic news, Michelle. I wasn't sure what reaction I'd expected, but excitement wasn't it. Congratulations. He looked at his watch and then stood. Look, I've got to run but. I'm really happy for you. As I watched his retreating back, I couldn't help but feel hurt that he didn't seem even slightly disappointed that we wouldn't be working together. Maybe he was just moving on, which meant I should do the same. If only my heart would cooperate. Chapter 15 I arrived at the soccer field with my hair and makeup done, hoping it would make me look better than I felt. Missy gave me the once-over and whistled. You make me feel on the plain side, Michelle. I gave her a half-smile. Well, you never know who you're going to bump into at a recreational soccer game. She narrowed her eyes. Still haven't heard from Brooks, huh? I shook my head. Nope. She turned around and picked up a tray of cups filled with orange juice. Well, now that you're here you can help hand out drinks to the players at halftime. She nodded to the players on the field, including Krista, who would be coming off in a few minutes for their halftime break. Why are you handing out orange juice? I asked. She shrugged. Apparently Krista signed up to bring drinks today and forgot. I owed her one, or, you know, like thirty, so I offered to swing by the store. And voila. I smiled. I'm happy to help. You're a good friend, Missy ducked as a soccer ball sailed over her head, but she managed to keep the tray of drinks she just poured upright. Impressive, I said, trying to be more upbeat for my friend, especially on the sunny day at the park. Unfortunately, 
I was feeling particularly down in the dumps. At least Krista is in the game. Seems like all I ever do is sit on the sidelines and watch. One of the subs turned around and faced me. You don't have to just watch. We're always looking for more players to join the team. It's great exercise. Oh, thanks, I wrinkled my nose and cringed. I was being metaphorical about being on the sidelines. You know, the sidelines of life and love. Her eyes widened and she nodded. Oh, I get it. Don't suppose you can help with a solution to either of those problems? Sorry, she said, smiling. I've got challenges of my own in that department. Missy leaned in closer to me. Shouldn't we be exercising right now? You might feel better. I sighed. To be honest, all I want to do is stuff my face with ice cream and donuts, so exercise is the last thing on my mind. It will pass, Michelle. Since Brooks had been the love of my life for a decade, I doubted it would pass, so I decided to change the subject. It's not all bad, actually. I signed the contract for my book, Once Upon a Date. She loves the title and says she's keeping it. Missy's face lit up. And why are you only telling me this fabulous news now when I'm holding a tray and can't hug you? That's amazing, Ms. Published Author. Did you end up publishing with a different editor at Prince and Company? So much for changing the subject. No, I went with the other publisher, Paradise Bound. They offered a larger advance and better terms. I am happy about the contract. It's just that I trailed off, not knowing how to finish the sentence. Just that it's not with Brooks. Well, thank goodness for that, right? I loved the way Missy always sided with me. When he and I dated when we were young, I would have changed schools just so I could be with him. To me, love comes before everything. And I felt the same way with the contract. I gave him my word, so I would have honored that, even though the deal wasn't as good. Doesn't sound like a good decision business-wise. Missy balanced the tray of drinks on one hand as the whistle blew for half-time, and she managed to put her free arm around my shoulder. It's a good decision morally to keep your word, though. I know you're a loyal person. And Brooks is just a, hey, careful. She balanced the tray as the players crowded around her, grabbing the cups, all hot and sweaty from their time on the field. Thanks for getting the orange juice, Missy. Krista grinned as she took a drink. Then we passed the rest of the cups out to the players, who hadn't received any yet. So, I said, as Missy set the empty tray down. Were you about to say that Brooks is a boyfriend of the past? I asked wishing I could push him there in my mind. Actually, I was about to say he is a breaker of hearts, she said, but that didn't make me feel any better. He really is, I said, giving Missy a hug for real this time. I'm really excited about your book deal. Congratulations, she said. Thanks, I said, hugging her back as the game started back up for the second half. I appreciate all of your support, especially letting me live in your penthouse for free. Finally, I can start paying you rent. Oh, please. I'd pay you to live with me. It's so much fun having you as a roomie. I'm glad you got a bigger advance, though, even if you would have stuck to your agreement with Brooks. I have put Brooks first every time, I said sadly. Not that it's done me much good. Well, that's one thing the two of you have in common, she said, her face perking up. Brooks puts Brooks first every time, too. I laughed at her joke, even though the tears were threatening to come. Look, the thing is, you need someone, you deserve someone, who will put you and your relationship first, she said, gesturing with her hand, the sparkly diamond on her ring finger catching the light. Brooks has never done that for you. Not back then, and not now. 
guess that's true enough. I picked up a still full cup of orange juice and sipped on it, wishing it were coffee. I don't know that Brooks will ever be ready for that kind of committed relationship. Maybe I've just been kidding myself this time around. Missy nodded to a wooden bench a little further away from the field and I followed, sitting down next to her. What do you mean? she asked. I don't think the real reason Brooks pushed me away is so I could get a larger advance with Paradise Bound. I feel like that's just an excuse, I said, sighing. His dad died when he was young. It was just Brooks and his mom until she met another guy and took off with him, leaving Brooks behind to be raised by his grandparents. I think he has real trust issues. I'm not sure he'll ever get over them. Although, I hope he does. Are you willing to wait around on the off chance that it happens? Missy asked, rolling her eyes. Look, Michelle, you're beautiful and smart and funny, and you will find your prince charming when the time is right. I found everything with Nick, the whole package of love and trust and commitment. You will find that, too. The real deal, the one you've always wanted. I'm sure you're right, I said, not really believing it, because the one I wanted was Brooks. He was the one I'd always wanted. But, Missy was right in one aspect. My real-life Prince Charming would put me first, too. I did deserve that much. I stood up as the whistle sounded, signaling the end of the game. I've got to go, but I'll see you and Krista at the fashion party this evening, okay? And you'd better dance with me since I don't have a date, promise? Missy touched her hand to her head in a salute as I left. Scout's honor. I had been looking forward to Missy's fashion party, but that was when Brooks was going to be my date. Now, I was going solo. I got ready with a heavy heart. My fairy tale dress was hanging on my closet door, and instead of feeling excited at dressing like a real life Cinderella, all I could feel was disappointed that Prince Charming, aka Brooks, wouldn't be there with me. I slipped the gown over my head and took a deep breath but not too deep as it had a very fitted bodice. I check my reflection in the mirror. It was certainly a beautiful dress. The delicate shade of blue complemented my eyes perfectly. There was just something missing, and it began with a B. I was pondering whether I should bite the bullet and call Brooks when there was a knock at the front door. My heart leapt into my throat as I wondered whether he had the same thought and was standing outside my door. Just a minute. I called and stepped out of the gown again, not wanting Brooks to see me in it until everything was perfect. My heart pounded as I pulled on my bathrobe, took a deep breath and went to the front door. Oh, Philip, I tried to hide the disappointment in my voice as I saw my brother standing in the hallway, but he didn't seem to notice since he gave me a big hug and then walked in. I closed the door and stood for a moment while I gathered my thoughts. If Philip asked me for another month's rent, I would say no. That's all there was to it. I haven't got long, Philip, I said, bracing myself for what he was here to say. Missy's fashion event is tonight and I need to finish getting ready. Are you okay, though? He smiled and nodded. Everything's great, sis. Guess what? I shook my head. I don't know, what? I got a job. My mouth dropped open momentarily and then I clapped my hands. That was good news, unless. Wait, this isn't one of those get rich quick things, is it? He chuckled. Nope, it's a real 9 to 5 job. Entry level, but I'm excited. I start on Monday. I'll be working for a big advertising agency downtown. They were impressed by my knowledge of designer brands, the one positive result of my shopping obsession, and said I'd be an asset to the company. My eyes filled with tears, but they were happy ones this time. I'm so proud of you. I knew you could do it. Things are looking up for you at last. He beamed. 
That's not all. I took the clothes that had their tags still on and returned them to Taylor and Sons for a refund. I also sold a lot of things, so I've managed to pay a month's worth of back rent, and, he beat out a rhythm with his hands on the coffee table as a drum roll, I will be able to pay the rest of the back rent off myself due to the new budget that mom helped me set. You made amends with mom? Yep. He sat on the arm of the couch. You were right about what you said. She had only cut me off financially. I'm the one who cut her off emotionally. She welcomed me in right away and showed me how to schedule payments with my paychecks. My finances are so organized now that you would never recognize it. That's great, I said, putting a hand to his forearm. No shopping for a while, of course, but that's one of the things that got me into this mess in the first place. Besides, the happiness from my shopping sprees was only fleeting. I'm glad you see that now. This is all thanks to you, sis. His expression took on a serious look. What you said to me really hit home. Which part? I asked. You told me I could become strong, one good decision at a time. You believed in me, but you also gave me no choice since you were cutting me off. I squeezed his forearm. I only had your best interests in mind. I know that now. Anyway, that's what I started to do, follow your advice. I broke it down to one decision at a time. And that's what I'm going to keep doing. I'm proud of you, Philip, I said, giving him a big hug. He squeezed me around the waist and started to dance around the room. Hey, nice dress. The fairy tale gown stretched across my bed, which we could see through my open bedroom door. Once Philip mentioned the dress, my sadness returned. Thanks, but I'm not really in the mood to wear it now, I said, biting my bottom lip. I don't want to be a downer after your good news, though. Sis, you've been there for me for years. It's my turn to be there for you. I smiled. Well, First with the good news. I sold my book. That is awesome. Then why are you down? I filled him in on what happened with Brooks. I know I deserve better, but I miss him. What is Brooks' problem? I liked the guy, sis, but he must be crazy letting you go. Are you sure it's over? Could it have been just a lover's spat? I mean, I'm no expert in matters of the heart, but you two always seemed made for each other. I shook my head, grateful for his support and touched that he was being sweet. I don't think so, because he seemed pretty definite. And he knew how important tonight was to my friend and he didn't even call me. Now I have to go alone. Philip pulled me in for a brotherly cuddle. Well, you need to get the dress on and paint on a smile, because Cinderella, you will go to the ball. Yes, I will go, I said, remembering how I'd forced myself to go to the masquerade ball and that had turned out well. For a short time, anyway. I'm sorry I was such a wicked stepbrother, Philip said, tilting his head to the side. Not an ugly one, mind you, but not the best. I laughed as I walked him to the door. Well, Philip, sometimes wicked stepbrothers just need a do-over in life to bring out the best in them. Maybe it's the same with modern-day Cinderella's, he said, kissing me on the cheek, before he escaped out the door, leaving me to get ready for the big night. Chapter 16 Missy's high-end clothing boutique, fashionably late, was packed when I arrived. I scanned the crowd for Krista, my date for the evening. I spotted her with some of our other friends and made my way over to her, grabbing a glass of champagne from a passing server on the way. Hey, Krista said, as she kissed me on both cheeks. She stood back and held me at arm's length. You look stunning. Definitely the belle of the ball. Ah, thanks, I said and then repaid the compliment, which was easy because Krista always looked stunning. Then I said hello to the rest of the group. 
Missy was remarkably calm as she held hands with Nick, her own Prince Charming. Next to them were Abigail and Cooper, Hannah and Blake, Jennifer and Dylan, Lucy and Jake, who all smiled in greeting. I was also delighted to see my friend from Blue Moon Bay had come tonight, as promised. Carrie Smith had told me she would be coming to town to take a look at an office space to rent, since she would be working on a mural she'd been commissioned to do. Missy pulled me aside. How are you doing? I'm totally fine, I said, giving her a brilliant smile. Yeah, right. Tell me, for real. Is it that obvious? I sighed, taking a sip of champagne. What can I say? I'm heartbroken, Missy. It helps that there are so many friends here, but... She nodded. I get it, trust me. Try and forget about the whole Brooks thing for tonight, so you can enjoy the evening. You never know, you might even find your real-life knight in shining armor. I smiled, appreciating her support. Things went from bad to worse, though, when the DJ put on the next song, and Celine Dion's beautiful voice began singing the words to Beauty and the Beast. Then Peebo Bryson joined in and my vision blurred. I quickly escaped to the restroom before anyone could see me. As the romantic song that Brooks and I had danced to at the masquerade ball rang out, memories flooded my mind and I couldn't take it anymore. I knew Brooks loved me. I felt it in everything he said and did. He may be able to give up on us easily, because he'd been hurt before, but I had the strength to be his knight in shining armor. I pulled my phone out of my purse and dialed his number before I could change my mind. I heard the click right away. Brooks? It's me. Look, we need to talk. It's just T.H. Hi, you've reached the voicemail of Brooks Keller. I'm unavailable to take your call at the moment, but if you leave your name, number, and a short message, I'll get back to you as soon as I am available. I waited impatiently for Brooks' message to end. When the beep finally sounded, I took a deep breath and said, You may not believe in modern-day fairy tales, Brooks, but I'm here to tell you they are real. I'm here with my friends and you should come see them. They've found their happy ever afters and it didn't always come so easily for them. I'm not letting you ruin ours because you're scared. We need to meet and talk this through. Call me. I hung up and slipped my phone back into my purse, feeling more nervous than ever. What if he didn't call me back? If he truly was my prince, then he would. I had to believe that. If not, well, I still wasn't sure I was ready to give up so easily. When I left the restroom, I noticed everyone hurrying out the front door. For a moment, I wondered if there was a fire or some other emergency, but there was no alarm ringing. I saw Frankie, a reporter from the news outlet Triple S, aka Sacramento Social Scene, hurrying by. What's going on? I asked him. Something to do with a white horse. Isn't that fabulous? That's all I know, he said, joining the crowd to exit fashionably late, even though the party had hardly begun. I frowned in confusion, but as there didn't appear to be anyone left in the store, I followed the crowd, which was, ironically, something I'd always tried to avoid. Missy, what's going on? I asked, catching up with Missy and Nick. Look, Michelle. Missy grinned and pointed to a beautiful white horse standing patiently in the street, a line of cars behind it, with some drivers honking their horns and others recording the whole thing on their cell phones. The tuxedoed rider turned his head as he searched the crowd until his blue eyes locked with mine. My heart flipped and I felt heat rushing to my cheeks. Brooks. I stared, with my eyes widening. I, I just called you. You didn't answer. He grinned. I was a little busy. I clapped my hand to my mouth. This was a scene from my book. 
In it, the hero needs to get to the heroine, but he's stuck in traffic, so he unhooks a white horse and rides through the mayhem to reach her. Ironically, it was also the scene that Brooks had branded as the most unrealistic. A police car pulled up and an officer approached Brooks on the horse. But before he could get to him, Abigail's boyfriend, Cooper, who was also a cop, called the officer over and asked him to give Brooks a minute. Brooks steered the horse toward me and came to a halt on the sidewalk. With one hand holding the reins he swept the other in the air in a sweeping gesture and cleared his throat. My name is Prince Brooks Keller, and by royal command it is decreed that I am to return to my kingdom only when I have Princess Michelle Moss by my side. I have been searching lands near and far for my lady, and I am not to return until I find her, for it is written in the stars that then, and only then, will I take my rightful place on the throne of Great Kellerdom. The horse began to get a little spooked as everyone inched closer and closer, looking from Brooks to me and then back to him again, not quite believing, but loving, what they were seeing. The police officer had now been joined by a colleague but neither of them made any move to stop Brooks' declaration. This is going to go viral online, I just know it, someone shouted, and the crowd laughed good-naturedly. Brooks, what on earth are you doing? I asked, in a half-whisper, half-yell. I was mortified, but genuinely moved, too. You're breaking the law. I need a do-over, Brooks said, as he jumped down from the horse. The only thing that will be broken here tonight is my heart, if you don't come with me, Princess Michelle Moss. A collective awe went up from the crowd, and I noticed that even the officer smiled. For once in my life, I'm making the unrealistic a reality to prove to you that I can and will believe in fairy tales as long as I have you. A silence fell on the crowd as everyone strained to hear what Brooks was saying. The truth is... I love you, Michelle. I've always loved you. I regret the choice I made when I was young and stupid. I should have put our relationship first like you did. I should have gone to a college near you. I won't make the mistake of separating us ever again. So. He knelt down on one knee and lifted his hand to reveal a tiny red velvet box. Inside was a sparkling ring with a princess-cut diamond sitting on a platinum band. I clapped my hand to my mouth as I realized this was the exact ring from my book. Will you do me the honor of marrying me? So we can live happily ever after? A lone cheer went up from the audience and I recognized Courtney's voice, which was swiftly stifled by more cheers as others waited silently for my reply. Everyone leaned forward, closer to us, as if they were straining to hear my answer. There's nothing I would love more, Prince Brooks. Yes, I'll marry you, I sobbed, as he smiled and slipped the ring onto my finger. You are my happy ever after, I said. Car horns beeped in celebration, a kind of modern-day fanfare, as Brooks took me in his arms, dipped me back low and kissed me in the middle of the street while the crowd cheered. Even with a modern-day, very realistic prince, my fairy tale dream had finally come true. The End If you enjoyed spending time with these characters, be sure to read Krista's story in the Island Date, Do Over Date series, Book 7. You have been listening to Once Upon a Date, Do Over Date series, Book 6, by Susan Hatler, copyright 2020 by Susan Hatler, audiobook copyright 2023 by Susan Hatler. Susan Hatler is a New York Times and USA Today best-selling author who writes humorous and emotional women's fiction and young adult novels. Many of Susan's books have been translated into German, Spanish, French, and Italian. A natural optimist, she believes life is amazing, people are fascinating, and imagination is endless. She loves spending time with her characters and hopes you do, too.